Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 197, Pull the Trigger, discussing endgame triggers. I'm Sean, your host, and we're here with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. Remember that we record here live Wednesday nights at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop, and we'd love it if you came and join us in our lobby, the chat room. Now, due to the fact both of us kept getting off track last week when talking about end game mechanics, we decided to do a follow up episode this week where we actually talk game end triggers. What causes a game to end and not what happens after that trigger happens? After that, we've got reviews of D Drop It from Cosmos and Thrones of Valeria from Daily Magic Games. We wrap up with another very full Bellhops tabletop segment. Before all that, though, let's stop by the mailroom to see what the community's been saying. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we share some of our interactions with you fine folk. All right, well, let's start off with a big one from Mr. Stonemeyer Games himself, Jamie Stegmeyer, who commented on last week's topic of board game endings to say, I love this sub subject. I think a lot about how the game will end and what happens afterwards when I'm designing a game, though it typically isn't later in the process until I solidify the exact details. For example, for Scythe, at some point in the process, I came up with the star system, which as an evolution from Euphoria was the end game trigger, but not the entire winning condition. Mm -hmm. But then I had to figure out how many stars was correct. I ended up feeling like six was the right number as I wanted it to be almost half of 10, the correct the number of glory categories, and I wanted the game to build uh, and to end after around 18 turns for pl per player or uh, 90 to 120 minutes. Plus, as an engine building game, I wanted to give players enough time to build and use their engines, but not so much time that they weren't or that they aren't left wanting one more turn. All of that said, I heard a lot of feedback about what happens after the game ends inside. <laughs> As you sure noted, you there are times when it feels quite abrupt. And in the Wind Gambit expansion, I added a bunch of other end game conditions and what follows as options for players to choose. Well, I hope Jamie also enjoys our follow up tonight. Uh, thanks so much for checking the topic out and sharing an insider look at what went into the end of Scythe. Just knowing Jamie listens is a feather on our cap for me. The other thing this comment did, though, was make me really want the Wind Gambit to see what those other possible endings are. Wow, we're here for the fans and players. Hearing feedback like that from an icon in the industry really does mm -hmm. make it feel like we're doing something, right? Fair. Now, next up, a comment on our Weather Machine unboxing that's worth getting out there before we sit down and try it for the first time. More Coffee writes, I can highly recommend the common rules mistakes thread of Board Game Geek. There are quite a few rules that aren't completely clear mm. in the rulebook. Well, thanks for the heads up, More Coffee. Uh, we'll be sure to check that out, though it's a bit surprising, uh, giving the publisher and design team. like That's, that's kind of like the, the holy trio of board gaming going on there with Eagle Griffin, uh, Eno Tool, and Vitalis Serta. Um, while there are other games like Vinhos are dense and the rule books are um, intimidating <laughs> and large with lots of text in them, and there's tons that's easy to forget, I don't remember any actual like ambiguity or lack of clarity in the rules. It was all there presented in one way. And I guess say the player aids were awesome for helping out in Vinhos. So I'm hoping it'll be the same in this one. Well, I did take some time to look these up. Uh, and it is a long list. Shockingly, some of Ian's art may have gone a bit over the top even, as there are ah. reminders that certain images don't actually mean anything. They're just pretty, and maybe I perhaps too thematic? <laughs> <laughs> interesting. It would be interesting to see. I've read the rules. The rules didn't seem ambiguous, but who knows until you actually get the game to the table. Indeed. Well, it seems we got at least one video game fan's attention with our Horizon Zero Dawn unboxing. Rom Game Sly, Gamer Sly writes, I'm just asking, 
But do you know of any games that are similar to the Resident Evil 2 and 3 board games that have campaigns that can be played one to two to three or four players? Well, this sounds like a great AMA question for a labor episode, but I wanted to answer this right away as soon as we got it. So right off the top of my head, I got to recommend Cthulhu Death May Die, the zombie side series of games, and getting back to games based on video games licenses, the Doom board game. Now, for something way beefier and meatier, you could also check out the Gloomhaven series where we recommend you start with Jaws of the Lion. And also, you're welcome for me not grabbing a scenario bo- uh, soapbox and going on about scenario-based versus amp- actual campaign games. Thanks for the comment, and good luck finding a new scenario-based game to play. Well, next up, two comments on our topic of games from our childhood we still enjoy. Uh, first up, Anthony Hargis writes... Clue, Life, and Chess are the only games that I played as a kid. The others you mentioned didn't come along until I wasn't a kid anymore. I thought you guys were going to talk about old games. <laughs> and next up, we have Prayerborn, who commented, Great segment. I was surprised at how many of them, which I hadn't heard, even in the 70s and 80s, gaming was bigger than we often realized. Now, for my list, I'd add Careers, Axis, and Allies. The series adds nice things but the OG is still great and awful green things from outer space. Well, thanks both of you for your comments Uh, to Anthony's point. The problem is that many of the older games we did play, we're not still enjoying playing. Um, Well, my copy of escape from the death star was fantastic when I was a little kid. And I especially loved the little stand with the little X wings in it. It just doesn't hold up now. Though I will call out Acquire as a much older game from the 60s, maybe even 50s. It's an old synth action game that I still enjoy today. The thing is, though, I discovered that once I was a modern hobby gamer and didn't play that as a kid. So it didn't make the list that way. Now, as for Prayerborn, I really need to play Access and Allies again. Now, unfortunately, I have the copy I had when I was a kid and it didn't survive me growing up. And I stole the miniatures from it to use when playing modern role-playing games. So various piles of them disappeared into the ether and my like giant drawer of bits to use for role-playing games. Now, if I knew someone else local with a copy, I would totally give Access and Allies another try. I do remember thinking it was way better than Risk at the time, and my dad really enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, next up, a great comment on our Hidden Games crime scene review. Andy Moran writes, Thanks. This helped a ton in making a gift decision. Nowhere else could I find a review for this, let alone such an in-depth, organized, and spoiler-free video. Now, that's a great comment. Um, I love hearing when we do things right like this. Uh, it makes me even more pleased that this, with, that our current review format uh, is working, especially concerning the mystery and puzzle-style games, which we have done a lot of reviews on recently, and I'm never sure what I should and shouldn't say, how much I should spoil, how much I should give away. So seems like we nailed it on this one. Well, while we've got plenty more in the inbox, I think it's time to move on. Now, if you sent us an email, commented on any of our contact or on our content, sorry, or contacted us on social media, and we didn't call it out on the show, just know we still greatly appreciate the feedback and please keep it coming. We just don't have enough time to cover them every week. Well, that's it for this week's comments. We always love it when you comment on our posts, email mo at tabletopbellhop.com or reach out on social media. We just wanted to take a moment to welcome our new listeners. So sometime late last year in December, we started to see a, a massive spike in podcast downloads. Well, things were going pretty steadily, like we've kind of been in a nice slow climb for for pretty much since we started. Suddenly in December, we hit a cliff and everything jumped up. It was pretty cool. Now, this led to us to hit the arbitrary milestone of over 100,000 podcast downloads much quicker than we expected. We were planning on celebrating that closer to our five year anniversary. Yeah, like we're now surpassed that by enough. It seems silly to even be talking about it now. Now, not that hitting it early is bad, I'm not complaining at all, but when this started happening, we figured it was a fluke, like plus, or or maybe a single episode, because in the past we had one episode, I don't remember which one, Sean I'm sure knows, that somehow took off on Pandora and still gets ridiculous number of downloads every week to this day. 
And I'm like, oh, maybe whatever, one of our Christmas episodes took off or something. But then the next episode did the same thing. And then the next one did the same thing. And now all of them are, are getting like 10 times the views they used to be. And the only conclusion seems to be that more people are listening. So again, I say, welcome new listeners. Like, follow, subscribe, hit the bell. Reviews are also always welcome. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight, we're doing a follow-up on last week's episode where we discussed board game ending mechanisms based on a question from patron of the show, Dr. Donna Bowman. So that episode, for those who haven't had a chance to listen or watch it, we understand things happen. We talked about what happens once the end of the game is triggered. What do you do? Do you finish out the round? Does the game end immediately? Do you go around the table once more turn? Does everyone but you get one more turn? And so on. Well, we discussed the most common ways to wrap up, highlighted unique and interesting endgame systems, and talked a bit about what makes for a good endgame. Now, the thing is, while talking about this on the show, and even when prepping and doing research for last week, we kept slipping from the actual end of the game to what happens to trigger that endgame? What causes the game to end? While thinking about endgame mechanics, we found we couldn't help but talk about endgame triggers. Now, while we did a pretty good job of staying on topic, everyone, both of us, Deanna, our moderator, and many of the people in the chat, noted that they thought the topic of endgame triggers would be an even more interesting topic. And here we are. Hopefully we were right. So what do we mean by endgame triggers? Well, that's the thing that happens in the game to cause it to come to an end. What happens before everything we talked about last week? While well, your game end may end after everyone else has a final turn, what we're talking about is what causes that final turn to start. It's that part of the game that you may be either rushing to activate or stalling to avoid, depending on how you're doing in the standings. Now, what I really want to get into is some unique endgame triggers and some of our favorites, but let's start about by talking about some of the more common ones out there. And there's surprisingly few of these once you realize that a whole bunch of dissimilar games have the same triggers. To that end, I want to start with the race game, where the end is triggered by someone getting to a set endpoint. Now, when I say race game, most people are going to think like car race, foot race, or something like that, where someone crosses a finish line, and those exist. Rallyman GT, Formula D, Flem Rouge, uh, Monza, kids game, all kinds of that. But there's also games that end when you hit the final spot on the board. Snakes and Ladders being the most classic version. There's also Candyland and lots of games that I played when I grew up with awesome mechanics like roll again, move back three, move forward three, and miss a turn. But then modern games like Point Salad and Space Base, sorry, Point Salad, where'd that come from? Point, <laughs> point Salad didn't mean there. Point Totals can also be a target. I'm red point and I'm thinking Point Salad. Sorry, Point Totals can also be that endpoint. And in the examples of these, the two big ones for me are Space Base and Catan, which are actually both played different at that point going to last week's topic. But for this point, they both end when someone hits a set point total. The whole thing here with race games is you want to be the first person to hit that point. And again, the point is conceptual. Sometimes it's a physical location. Sometimes it's an arbitrary number, but it is a fixed goal to mm -hmm. be reached. Next up, uh, the one I thought of next was Last Man Standing. Now, one of the things you may not think of is that almost every two-player game is actually a player elimination game. One player eliminates the other player, thus ending the game for both of them. Now, you're also going to see this in quite a few multiplayer games, especially Take That style games and older, again, older, especially IP games. But modern games like King of Tokyo, Red Dragon Inn, or Munchkin, where you're either eliminating other players. Oh, sorry, Munchkin wouldn't count. You don't actually eliminate Playpool and Munchkin. Munchkin's first player. Munchkin belongs in the last group. When you get to 10 points, you've then, you, you then win in Munchkin. I was just thinking, take that so much can pop to my head. But Red Dragon in when your when your alcohol level and your endurance meet, you pass out, you're out of the game. Last man standing. King of Tokyo is King of the Hill. That's where the name comes from. You're playing King of the Hill over Tokyo, trying to be the last monster standing. Um, you'll find this in both, at least strategic games. Like that's the end game trigger in chess is you're the last one standing. 
though capturing a certain piece may be a subcategory of these we didn't think of when I was working on the research, and in many take that party games where players are eliminated. And I've never understood why party games eliminated people like this, but it really is a popular party game thing. Uh, we're all going to keep having fun, but you go sit in the corner. <laughs> At least if it's a two-player game, there's no feeling of being left out, just of losing. Right. Plus, when the two-player game ends, there's usually that feeling of revenge where you're just like, let's go again. You can't really do that while you're waiting for everyone else to play. Uh, the next one would, I, I don't know, uh, it, like we didn't come up with names for each of these, but the set number of rounds. Uh, you play the game for X rounds. At the end of that last round, you see who wins. And most of these, it's the player with the most points, especially in Euro games. Um, some of our favorites are, of course, Castles of Burgundy or Terraforming Mars. But it could be the furthest up a track or the player with the most money or whoever has the most of a specific resource that wins at the end of these rounds. So there is something reassuring about the set knowledge. It goes along well with games where perfect knowledge is important, uh, where you can, if you are so inclined, calculate everything along the way and plan out that deep strategy. Mm -hmm. Now, similarly, many gamers don't like this because it doesn't allow their play to impact the game in as many ways. Nothing they do can change that end game point. Yeah, one of the problems with this, and it's something we talked about a bit about last week and something maybe we'll get onto later tonight, is player agency. You have zero player agency in a game that ends after 10 rounds or after everyone takes six turns or after you play six hands of cards. That is default set by the game. Next is another one where no player agency, and that's a set number of rounds followed by a random ending point. Here, you're going to play 10 rounds, but then you keep going with the chance the game will end each round after that. Uh, the perfect example of this for me is um, Downfall of Pompeii. You know that you seeded the last Vesuvius card in the last 10 cards in the deck, so any time after card 11 is drawn, that a volcano could go at any time. Another example of this isn't the end game trigger for Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade, but it's a trigger that starts the end part of the game, which then sets a new timer that counts down. So this one's odd because it ends up that the game has very old length, but the actual very end end game is a set amount, but you don't know what that's going to be until the trigger goes off. That's a really interesting version of a random ending point that actually comes up in the middle of the game instead of at the very end. Indeed. Now, this format applies some tension. Attention was a topic we talked about again last week uh, as another something that, something that helps make a good ending. Uh, but at the same time, knowing you can't do much about it or even account for it means it's not as pressing attention as some other forms. True, though this is the one where I feel like people try to squeeze in as much as they can because you don't know when it's going to end. Mm -hmm. And they tend to take more risks and then they get riskier and riskier as it, the trigger hasn't happened. Like, if you know it's going to end in the last five turns, and it, you're, like, ready for it on that fourth turn or whatever, and you're like, no, it hasn't. Okay, I'm going to try this. Okay, if the game goes two more rounds, I'm also going to pull this off. And that's what I enjoy about that particular style. Now, another one that's uh, a set point for ending, but something that's not tied to the actual mechanics of the game would be a game running on a timer. Now, you're going to see these a lot in Escape Room in a Box and Mystery Games, but you also see them out there in other games, like Galaxy Trucker that uses a sand timer, or Fuse, which uses a literal timer, um, and Breakdancing Meeples, where you get so many times to roll your dice and you have to stop when the music stops. Another example would be Meeple Circus, where you're trying to build as many stacks of meeple and, and elephants and things to match the patterns, but when the carnival music stops, you've got to start stop placing. Now, in that particular game in Galaxy Trucker, it's technically when the round ends, but that also applies to the final round. And this could be an app, a watch, an old good old sand hourglass, <laughs> music playing. Uh, this trigger is designed for steady tension. Mm -hmm. Different from that last type of unknown ending, this unchanging pressure of inevitable end, regardless of what you do or don't do. You know it's coming. You know when it's yeah. coming. And 
it, it's nothing will change that. Nothing will stop <laughs> that. It's very different than than rounds because you can take yes. longer in a round to to drag it out. But mm-hmm. the time waits for no one. And this is a mechanic that some people adore. Some people don't mind. And some people like our moderator absolutely hate not being able to pause to take a breath and feeling that pressure can be overwhelming and lead to um, basically locking up. Right. Like just failing to be able to do anything. Well, and also, I mean, we've we've run into we're going to talk about this later, but uh, some people like the to analyze things and like yes. to figure out the best solution. And when you've got a clock going, it becomes that much harder to mm-hmm. do so. All right, this one I still can't decide if I should even have on the list because I have a feeling that each of these are actually separate triggers, and I kind of lumped them because I have a feeling this is everything. So I was thinking about it as like goal driven triggers, and where where this was coming from is adventure style games where this scenario your goal is to do one thing like escape the house but then you go to the next scenario and it's kill the shoggoth in the basement and then the next time you play it's collect 80 gold so you can afford that new armor and that's what i was thinking of but just setting that as a trigger every game has gold driven endings like the the goal of Catan is to get to 10 points the goal of fuse is to defuse as many bombs as you can in the time limit. Uh, that's that's more goal for points. So I'm not sure if goal triggered ending. It's 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 when when it can change and it's driven by a scenario and that can change game to game. I think is where I want that that's to stick out as different from the other ones. Yeah. So I think the key for me, the key to this one is scenario dependence. So you're yeah. playing one game. And the game doesn't change, but within that game, within the, the you know the scenarios you're playing or the or the the types of game within that you're playing, that end trigger is going to be different depending on what right. you're doing, which dungeon you're in, what you know, or which you know which room of the house, which time of the house, time you're going into the haunted house, whatever it is. Um, and now this actually sort of moves into another similar but perhaps you we, we're not sure whether it's different or not uh, <laughs> and that's games where you pick every player has a different end game trigger that you you pick or are assigned in yes. some manner so that one's an interesting one right so so everyone has a different end game trigger and and this is is asymmetric games for sure right chaos in the old world's one of the first i played that had that where everyone's end goal was different and everyone had a different way to trigger the end of the game tied on that goal. And then everyone got a final turn to catch up to f- complete their own goal. And in the end, though, everyone was still trying to collect the same thing in that game. So, like, you were doing different things to get it, and you could trigger it different ways, but the end result was basically to compare points. They weren't called points. More recently, I've learned more about coin games, and, of course, the, the intro to coin games nowadays, Root. Um, another really good example are the vast games. And I don't even know if Sean knows about the vast games because they're not, I've never gotten to try them, but it's a game where like vast, the caverns, one person's the paladin, another's a goblin, another's a dragon, and someone's the cavern. And they each have their own goal. What I don't know is if they can trigger the ending differently or if it like ends over after eight rounds. I know there are a few games. I believe it's the Pax games where depending on which role you play, uh, it yeah. d- determines your end game uh, trigger. Yeah, the uh, Pax Imperium, Pax yeah, uh, the, exactly. the Neo games, as I tend to call them. I haven't, I have not had the pleasure of trying any of those. Yeah, nor nor have I. But uh, you know, again, in reading up for this, Pax came up on a number of different threads involving the fact that you know, again, it's every player, every whatever role they take determines the type of end game trigger that they have right. to deal with. So yeah, I think that's technically a different one, right? That that's unique player based. We'll, yeah. we'll call it player so, based, so faction scenario, based, scenario based goals versus and then faction based. based. I, w- I would think faction based faction. probably fits faction based because there is another type where players get to set their own end game triggers. And I have not actually played a game in this category. I've heard about them on shows like Ludology. When doing research for this, a couple came up. Uh, I think Acroteri might have been one of them. Sorry, I'm blanking on the names I'd seen where at the beginning, the players are given a selection of cards and pick their own end game condition. I think that I would call player driven, not faction driven. So, so rather than, so rather than a random draw that it's an, it's a, you're picking you a get, known set. Well, yes. Uh, another example is, um, 
the Benny Gesserit. In the Dune board game, we're, now we're that's getting a win into Unity. That, that's, that, that's, is that a that's win condition? A nope. If okay. they win, if they picked the winner of the game. Well, it's not the winner. It's also what game round it ends, which is why I was thinking it was a trigger. No, because it, if it's, they it's, pick... a way, it's how they score. They either okay. they win the game or they don't based on that guess made at the beginning of the game. Fair enough. But I, I, there are some out there where I know like the player determines. Uh, so it, here's a... Okay, here's an interesting one that I don't know if this fits. Tales of the Arabian Nights, I uh, it, a fantastic role playing style experience. Man, we got to do that with Tori Cat and you. Um, but fantastic game where you're wandering around in the the lands of Simbad, and you're you're playing out the story of Shahrazad where she's trying to keep uh, what I can't remember who the emperor or whatever interested so he doesn't kill her, and you're playing out the various adventures. Well, that one there are two tracks, and I don't remember what they are. Let's say it's power and glory, just because I'm probably way off. At the beginning of the game, you have to decide what level the game ends at. And you, you set a balance and you don't end your game until like, it's the first person who gets that balance that wins it. So like, like it's out of 40. So you're like, I'm going to get 30 power, but only 10 glory. And you could get more than that. But until you hit that, that triggers the end of the game. But you actually get to set that at the beginning of the game. Now, I will put the caveat in that that's really dumb because the game's almost pure random. Like, you're making awesome RPG decisions, but, like, until you've memorized a book that's this thick, you don't know what's going to give you glory versus power. Fair. Now, here's one that uh, isn't on our list, um, and this may go along with, with your idea, Clue. So Clue ends when a player decides they have the knowledge necessary yeah. to... Uh, to end the game, and they may be wrong; it may not end, <laughs> and Ooh, which yeah. they're eliminated, and it's over for them. But the game continues unerringly without that player until the next person determines that. The, yeah. So the end game condition. I would say is, that's a player driven. Is knowing that they have the correct information. <laughs> yeah. The, the, well, the trigger is a player calling for the end of the game, and then the win condition is: do they have the correct answer? Well, yes, but it's weird because again, if if it's it's if it's wrong, have, if the game could continue. Yeah, yeah. it's it's no, it's only a trigger if they're right. That's the thing. Yeah, it's the that Pax is calling it the I'm going to try to end the game, but might fail. Catter, there's other games that have that. Maybe yeah. Pax can help us out here. But I know I played games where you're like, I think I've got it. I'm going to end the game, and right. then you do the thing at the end, and you're like, oh, I didn't have it. Yeah, and I, I I know I own a game that does yeah, that. Yeah, I'm I, drawing I know, a I know blank. what you're thinking of, and it, it, and it did me skip my mind earlier when we were doing notes. Yeah, but all of a sudden I'm like, as we're talking, I'm like, wait, player driven? Clue, Clue is like yeah. super. Clue player is driven. definitely player driven, definitely. Um, an, another interesting one for the queen, the group decides how deep in to put the card, but the trigger is you get to that card. So I don't know. Yeah, but you get I mean, to decide where that trigger is. So that's kind of an odd one. Yeah, and, and I mean, for for the queen, we could argue all day long whether or not it's a board game in our, or an RPG as well. Yes. <laughs> uh, so that one, again, is there the end game trigger is the queen comes up. Yes, um, the, the final card comes up is the trigger, but it's the fact that players can decide how deep in the deck that is. Right, but is that, that, but is that me... part of the trigger or is that part of the setup? Yeah, I don't know. We're not, we haven't gone back early enough into this. Yeah, yeah we, we haven't setup. gone back. It's it's not late enough. It's not December 2023 where we talk about game setup. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a timing, but is it timing of the in-game trigger, which and is kind of... Well, that's the thing, though. I mean, Part of this topic is, or not? Timing, I think, is a setup mechanic. Yeah. Which is interesting. Like, but know, then we're talking about mechanic, variable... Yeah, but then, then the, the variable ending trigger where you don't know if it's going to end this round and that round is also timing, but it's at the end of the game, not at the setup. Well, you've set up That's a variable timer, but you, the, the end game me mechanic is, um, when that timer unknown. goes off. Yeah. It's when yeah, it it's... goes off, but it, because it's unknown, um, it's our unknowable or, or uh, <laughs> depending it, on it, it, you have a range. It's yeah. predictable. Yeah. It's unknown, um, but predictable. Yeah, exactly. All right. All right. We're We're getting off on a tangent. So another one, and this one I think is fascinating because this is a trigger that is used along with other triggers usually, except for like the two player one we've already talked about. And that is the game ends when you lose. So this could be a cooperative game with a loss condition like pandemic, 
which therefore it's standalone, or something like Twilight Struggle, where it's possible for both players to lose if they don't watch the Den contract. Otherwise, the game ends when the tug of war gets pulled. No, it's so many rounds. After so many hands of cards, the game ends. But it could end prematurely with a loss. Right. And this is something very common in, co- in co-op games. Uh, and I like to think of it as the same as a the, the goal condition, except the, the primary difference in what separates it from the goal conditions we were talking about earlier is it's the game's goal. Right. Yeah. It's not a player goal. It's not a group goal. The game's goal is to make everyone lose you know, is, is to have the game itself win mm-hmm. to, uh, in essence. And, and so the designer's goal, <laughs> the designer's goal. Yeah. So like going back to those, we were talking about scenario based goals. Well, most of those usually have a loss condition along with a win condition. So I think it's probably the same thing. It's a scenario driven trigger where the scenario is like Gloomhaven TPK. Right. If, if every player is knocked out, that is one of the end game triggers. The yep. other is you accomplish the the scenario goal. Right. So well, I think the yeah, they are player, intricately linked. Yeah, there. they're they're very much linked. It's just the difference between you know the player the player activity or the game. Yeah. Mechanical. So it doesn't activity. have to be the game because you could have Star Wars Imperial Assault where there is an opposing player doing it, or you could have um, Descent, the original Descent, first and the the second edition before the app. Well, I mean, is Imperial Assault not the same as player elimination? Whoever wins, the other person is eliminated. No, because it's goal based. Uh, okay. So it, so it's the, the you know the rebels have to go open this crate, but if the imperial player destroys the crate or kills all the imp- rebels, the game ends. Like it's all right. steal the snow speeder or whatever. They're all right. They're right. all actually very unique for for a dungeon crawling game. Fair. Yeah. All right, another one. When a resource runs out, the game ends. Um, this could be a single player thing. Like if your deck of cards runs out in a game of Magic: The Gathering, you're out which I know a lot of people forget that rule because it's not one of the more common unless your person you're playing against is playing one of those nasty deck depletion decks. Um, Or like you run out, the the game ends when the bank runs out of money. Owen would know this one. 18XX has used that. Or Food Chain Magnet, when the bank runs out of money twice because there's a weird thing in that when the bank runs out of money once, there's a refresh and then the game enters its end game state. And when it runs out a second time, it's over. Now, what's interesting about those particular money-driven ones is the speed that happens is totally driven by the players. You can just cut back on spending to make the game go longer, which is fascinating to me. A container is another uh, example of that, where the players control the market, and based on how everyone's playing, you could technically extend the game as long as you want, almost, until that one player is pretty sure they've won, and then they make the big thing to deplete the bank, right? That's a huge part of some of the most heaviest games on the market. Right. And a lot of people will say that Monopoly fits into this category. Uh, the game only ends when somebody's self-respect runs out and they finally just storm off. Uh, or as Snail Runs in the chat says, when someone flips the table, it's all over. Yeah, uh, that, that, that is definitely one. We're, we're going to get to that as an ending in a minute, but that, that's not the planned one. I, I, I think that's, that's the you knock yourself out <laughs> version. So those are the, the, the ones that came to mind to me when thinking of the most common ways games come to an end. And it's really surprising because almost every game fits the first few, right? Yep. Like the, the, the get to the end of the track or get to the set goal or it ends after a set number of rounds, which even goes into card games, right? Number of hands you play in a game of Euchre or whatever, or it goes to a set number of points or something runs out. Like the, there's not as much variety as I was expecting. Yeah, it narrow it narrows down. There there are interesting ways to represent these various endgame triggers, which is I yes. think what a lot of games do well. But when you actually sort of distill it down to its base concept, it's oh wait, no, that's one of these, you know, four, five, six categories. Um, even the really, really interesting ones that you think are so unique, when you actually sort of move away all of the the the, the extra game mechanics that lead yep. to it the trigger itself is usually something a little more simple than you might expect. Which does lead me to think this isn't quite the conversation I wanted to have yet. (laughs) I kind of want to talk about like games with really neat things going on. So I think that's how we're going to end this, not end it, but continue move on to move on to the end game. We've hit an end game trigger. We're going to move on to the end game. Um, Talking about interesting triggers uh, for which I feel we need to start with side. 
uh, as that was the game that started all of this talk in the first place. So I would say Scythe has a complete X goals out of Y triggers. There's 10 possible ways to end stars, and the game ends when any one player has completed six of the 10. And yeah, I guess that's kind of first to six, but it's the fact that it's a subset of 10 that to me makes it more interesting than just get six out of 10 points. I, I, to me, I just, I disagree on this one. So for me, uh, I see again, when you distill it down the side, there's no difference between scythe and space base. Uh, once one, six out of 10 and one is 40 out of, you know, a hundred billion, you know, you know, an infinite number. <laughs> see the, yeah. But that's um, the difference to me is the fact you're limited to just 10 and you have to pick which of those 10 space base you have a pretty much infinite way of gaining points with all the different cards and combinations and dice that can be rolled whereas in scythe you have to pick from a subset of 10 that selecting six out of a subset of 10 is i think what makes it stand out well i i, I see where you're going and I, I i understand but at the same point if you're playing the game and you're building the engine as as jamie was mentioning you know it's an engine building game if you're building your engine you are going to hit these targets you're going to hit Eventually, if you if if you weren't to stop, you would hit all ten. Uh, so well, it's no, because it, it's not engine. like that inside. That's part of the thing. Is inside there are definite decisions on which to go for and which not. Well, yes, but those are involved in speed. Again, it, given an infinite amount of of turns, you could still be at zero popularity by the end of the game. Popularity doesn't slowly build up inside unless you build an engine that gives you popularity. <laughs> as an example, battles, yeah, you're probably going to fight, but technically, you could play scythe for a hundred rounds and no one attacks anyone. Yeah, like like I, I that's where I'm thinking it's different, right? It's it's you're making a conscious decision of I'm going to go for that. I'm going to go for that. See, Some of them. That's, yes, that's, like that's, like building all your buildings yeah. is probably going to happen. Building all your mechs is probably going to happen. Putting all your guys out on the on your board is probably going to happen. So I would say three to four of those are, yeah, predetermined. But again, you're making you're, you're making a choice which ones to go to or which ones yes. not. But you can't choose to I don't you can't really choose to avoid all of them. You you may not be able to do popularity and battles, but by 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 skipping one, you're going to go the other in the other direction. So again, you're going to get to that point. It's mm. it's about who gets there the most efficiently and, and the fastest. Basically, well, yeah, that's that's the main um, goal of the game, right? Then we're getting into winning conditions and trying to win. I I don't know. I'd have to look at Scythe again and what those triggers are to see if it's inevitable you would get six. Because like ones complete your private goal. I almost never do that one unless I draw the cards and go, well, that's easy. And I do it, but like, I'm not going to accidentally get my private goal. I get, I suppose it depends on what the private goal is. <laughs> yeah. There are some you might, but, but even uh, then I think it's a conscious decision to claim it. So even then you right. could just avoid claiming it. If what well, like for one, you don't want to trigger the end of the game because you're not winning being Absolutely. a reason, reason why you would do that. And that's another part of this is, is I find inside there's a really strong reason to not trigger Absolutely. the game you can because yeah, those stars are not back. necessarily your points right yes like you they're tied back. to part of it but holding back on those is another thing that i think makes this stick out compared to a race because i did there when i talked about race i clarified that the goal is to be the first to get there inside that is not the goal fair i i i yeah i, I was overlooking that because i don't necessarily i did say that. that part of the race but yes you're right see the problem is i mean even in that point, then you can take space base out of the race as well, because the first person is there any reason win. to hold back? The first, well, the first person doesn't win. So if you wanted to hold back on 39, because next turn, you might be able to pull up 12 points in one turn, whereas this point in time, you're only going to get two and someone else is at 38 yeah. and might be able to get six. To me, that seems like a real edge case, though. I think in general, you're trying to get to the end of space bases track as quick as possible. Yeah, it, that's it's iffy. Yeah, and, and, um, and Azul. There's another one. There's another one that, D, that D, D's mentioning, which is a good sign. You can you can trigger the end in Azul and get crushed. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. You, there, there's good reasons to not trigger the end. Yep. So what would Azul be? Player uh, driven? I guess that's a player yeah, driven, like player Clue. Driven. You you're, we'll end it when you think you're winning. Yeah, the trigger is whoever builds that yeah. last horizontal uh, or the first. Which horizontal. you can be forced to do though in Azul. I played to make yeah. someone else have to draft the thing to end the game before. Well, it's still player. It doesn't come You're up often. Them to finish it, but it's still yeah, player driven. True. Um, it's either either by choice or by force. It's the force is another player, not the game system itself forcing mm -hmm. you to do it. 
Uh -huh. You could also do it accidentally in Uzzul, I suppose. Well, yes, that uh, that, that, that actually sure happens surprisingly that often. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure I've done that earlier on. In so, my... so another example is resource depletion. No tiles left in the bag or Alhambra. Two stacks of rooms gone down in Castles of Mad King Ludwig. Um, three decks of cards in Dominion is another example of that one. Right. Which is another one, though. The interesting, like, of those, Castle of Mad King Ludwig, I think, yeah, Castle of Mad King Ludwig more so, and even more so uh, the other one. You Again, you can kind of drive it. Like, if you know one set of tiles is running low, and no, because Ludwig gets randomly determined which card tiles come out. But there are actions you can take that put out extra rooms right. that could speed up the ending. So that's where it gets interesting with depletion. Well, and there's there's game there's games that uh, we've talked about, uh, or maybe we talk about later. I don't remember. But there there are games where there's a set number. Uh, Zulkin. There you go. Perfect. Yeah, we'll, that's we'll the next. Zulkin. <laughs> that was the next one I was going to bring up. So go for it. So in Zulkin, it is a fixed number of rounds, except yep. you have the ability to skip rounds mm -hmm. uh, to accelerate the the, the solar clock. Um, so it is fixed but there is player agency involved in a fixed round thing, which is something yeah. we talked about not ha normally happening. Not normally, uh, So yes. Zulkin is an exception to that rule of players not being able to adjust a fixed round count. Yeah, which I actually like that. And the other thing with Zulkin is also not only accelerating the end of the game, it also makes a huge impact on the round that happens because everyone's pieces move an extra spot. But that's not end game mechanics. That's just a neat thing I like in Zulkin. Right. But it, uh, it does affect the end game mechanic, which is a set number of turns. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it, the, the thing is, Sean worded this as as you skip a turn, but is it actually just making the game shorter? Yeah. So I. Uh, that's that's I where actually... I'm not sure. Uh, so I what I uh, what I actually put in the notes is I you are forced into a one of the turns becoming an inactive turn. So the number of turns is the same, but one of them you don't do anything. Yeah, but no one does anything. So to oh, me, yeah. that's not even a turn. Well, and to, to me, it just the game gets turn. shorter. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. The number of actions you are going to get to take in the game will be reduced. Correct. Yes. One way or the other. So yeah, that was one I wanted to bring up because Olkin's definitely got an interesting one. And I'd spent too long since I played it, but I keep thinking that um Gentis, with its spend your time tokens, mm. has something interesting going on, but it's been too long since I played that to remember the very end game. I haven't played that since Queen City Conquest 2019. So I'm I'm trying like I love the fact that your turn length is player driven based on what actions you take, but I can't remember how that impacts the end of the game. So uh, Danielle brings up Discworld, the board game that has a core game and mechanic of the game deck runs out. So the trigger of the deck runs out. But every player has their own characters that had their own end game goals that could stop the game. So if you're playing Grimes, if their character if it was having their character in the game ends normally. Having that character. So, so one of the characters end was the normal end. And then other characters have their own end game triggers. That's the way I understand that. Yeah. So one of the players, it seems like the Grimes doesn't actually have a trigger. Other yeah, than it doesn't the have their own. Normally, what others have specific See, that's a cool end one. games trigger. Yeah, that's a. So another one I was thinking about when we were talking about this goes to last week was Betrayal House in the Hill. Mm -hmm. But I think then you're getting into that whole scenario driven. It's a scenario driven ending. Sometimes the game ends when you get out of the house. Sometimes it happens when the haunt is defeated. Sometimes it happens when the haunt meets up with the rest of the group. Sometimes right. it ends when you find a specific room. But again, to me, that's just a, a yeah. extremely varied scenario driven. Yeah, essentially, it's the same as Gloomhaven with just a few more possible choices yeah. to pick from. Whatever, 50 haunts where each one's <laughs> unique or whatever. Uh, next one I came up with that I really like is the ending for the Revolution series of games which I, I can't even remember all the names of them, but the one I own and like the most is 1812 Invasion of Canada. There's also two U.S. ones, and they've done... Um, I've got a Norse one, but I can't remember if the Norse one has this, the Viking one. I can't remember if it has this specific endgame trigger. I think it does, because they'll do, because this is actually one of my favorite endgame triggers, because it feels really thematic. So this is a card-driven, cube-pushing war game, all about trying to control areas on the map. 
Well, you have you have to play cards to move your units around and to do stuff. And you have your generic move troops, but then you also have a bunch of historic people doing things tied to what they did historically. But every deck in for every player has a truce card in it. And the game ends, and you can just play truce card as your turn. And it's actually a good way to kind of sit back and do nothing for a turn to watch what happens. But the game ends when all players on one side, because in that game, you play like five players, three players will be on one side and two will be on the other. So like three are on the Canadian side and two are on the U.S. side in 1812. The game ends when play all the players from one side have played their truce card. So interesting, like like one of the U.S. players can play their truce card and two of the Canadian facts play their truce card and the game keeps going. But like none of the U.S. could play theirs and all three of the Canadians can and the game ends. And I think that's really fascinating because it's a player driven ending like we were just talking about, but it's also a card game based on a deck of cards. And you may not get the truce when you want to end it or even possibly just as like if you wait too long, you'll be forced to play it because it's the only card in your hand. And I think that one's really fascinating. Yeah. So it's player driven mutual agreement, which is an odd, an interesting with your uh, faction. One. But uh, but at the same time, there is that randomness thrown in to skew the ability to have, make a mutual decision, right? If it, everyone wants to do it, but you can't because uh, mm -hmm. because you don't have the cards. Uh, now, another one I was thinking about was uh, that it may fall under complete the goal, but I think this stands out as unique because it's not scenario driven. And this are the 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 catch a player games, the the Scotland Yard, the Mister Jack, the Fury of Dracula, Specter Ops, and many other either one versus many or players versus the game. Top Secrets, another where you're trying to catch someone. Now in Fury of Dracula, there's a whole thing where you battle them at the end, but to me that triggers the end game, and then the battle is kind of like a final stage. I think that's an interesting subset because it's kind of goals. And it's, but it's not because it doesn't change. Every time you play the game, it's that same goal. Right. So I, I think to me, it's sort of, it's, it's, there's two, two, two possibilities here. So there's player elimination. If you catch, uh, if you catch the bad guy, that player is eliminated and you win. The other team wins. Yeah. Whereas the, 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 the other side, uh, if you can evade being caught, um, you're going to win, which is the goal. Usually turn-based. That one's usually turn-based, right? If the, the person gets away for X turns, they've escaped. Right. No, so it's so, so that's an interesting kind of match. Of, yeah, yeah, it's that mix of different uh, opposing trigger styles. Um, Loa, like we talked about uh, in Netrunner, right? Netrunner, there's three different end game triggers yeah. in the game. That's true. Yeah, there's there's get to whatever the target is. I can't remember influence whatever it's called. Yeah, get to the whatever the set amount, but then the hacker can be killed from either net or, or physical damage. And then the um, corp can lose the game by running out of resources, which is cards in their CPU deck. Right. So yeah, that's another one with it, with an interesting. Yeah. So uh, and it's, again, it's, they're not different. They're, they're nothing we haven't talked about already, but the fact that they've compiled three of them into, into one, one game, game yeah. makes it interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, how about funky ones where the game ends when something breaks, I guess we'll call it. Um, Jenga being the main one, right? The game ends when the tower falls or games that use the tower like Dread or Starcrossed or maybe even like 10 candles where the last candle out of 10 goes out, the game ends and everyone dies. Right. So I saw this referred to as self-destruction uh, <laughs> online. I guess. Uh, and it kind of fits. Um, it's often sort of mingled with a timer in some games uh, where if you look at a game like Perfection, um, but you have to be careful because in perfection, the timer is the actual yeah. trigger. The destruction is the end game mechanism. There's one um, we didn't get to uh, last week is the game <laughs> destroys itself. The game explodes, yes. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so again, that's that's one of those things, though, where, you know, you're trying to, there may be a timer involved as well uh, in games like, does Junk Art have a timer? The problem with Junk Art is it's another scenario based one because each different, sometimes it's cooperative build the tallest, sometimes it's build as quick as you can. There, there's various different versions of Junk right. That's what I love about Junk Art is it's like 30 different stacking dexterity games in one. But it's one I of those, can't remember if any have a timer. Right, Many of them I, have rounds. What I was thinking of is, you know, if you've got a timer and you're knocking things down because of the tension and pressure from the timer, 
Yes. Um, you know, that's that's sort of you. It, it doesn't necessarily trigger the end game. The timer is triggering the end game, but the pressure of the timer is causing you to completely defeat yourself. Yes. <laughs> What's interesting is you start thinking about dexterity games. I'm like, oh, they'll be unique. So, so I got, I got to wonder, is Gokuku have a unique end mechanic, which is pull off a physical stunt, like, like you run out of eggs, but then you have to place that final heavier piece on top. What, what is that? Mm, like, I want to say the trigger is place your last egg, so it's resource depletion. You run out of eggs, but really, there's one more step after that, and if you mess up, the game doesn't end. Right, and I'm not sure what to call that. That's a, uh, what's the what's the end game trigger for Rhino Hero? We run out of cards. I th- no, it's you have to deplete your hand of cards. Mm, okay, because you're you're wait a resource depletion. I I, I think it's resource depletion because then you you add up the 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 roof cards you play on other players, but really the end of the game is when it falls. What I can't remember is what the tiebreaker is, is if you run out of cards because they don't expect you to, which we have done twice. So Before technically it's when it so falls over. I, like you're you're trying to play all the cards. You play your cards, which are rules onto other players that make them do things. But your goal is to have them fall by doing that. And you give them the card that's the nastiest. Like I can barely ever put, you know, <laughs> I can't get one yeah. round up. I'm horrible at that game. Uh, Pax is mentioning one in here. And let's see if, if, if it's something already out there. Um, the haste, the hacky sack ending. How long can you keep the ball in the air? Uh, thinking of mm. super skill pinball, which is about keeping the ball alive. Does that does that fall into one we've already discussed, or is that unique? I mean, the thing with that is, is it's a random roll, and eventually you're going to fail that roll, and the ball is going to sewer. So that basically like, like, comes into 40k, which we're going to talk about shortly. Yeah, kind of. Uh, so. So super skill, though, there is some skill to it because like there, you use up numbers and mm. if you can keep the like if if you get enough of the bumpers, things reset and there's more to it. But there's that fact that, that there's the chance you could like the trigger is you've used up your third ball and the way you could lose your ball is that you rolled badly or you, you planned poorly. You didn't play the odds. Right. So so I'm thinking it's a random ending that technically could go on forever. So it's a random ending that is modified by player action. Yeah. Yeah. Like kind of what's available, right? Like in, in different, I've, I've only watched a couple different boards get played, but different ones have different things you do to reset parts of the board. So here's one is I, I'm try, trying to think of, of, of a way this could be similar in another game. Are there any games where the end game is in the deck, but you have the ability to modify that and move the end game back further in the deck? Not that I can think of. There's got to be one like using tiles or something. Because that, that's what I'm thinking of. Is, yeah. is, is the, the same sort of mechanic would be that, right? If you've got a, a stack of tiles or a stack of cards and, some, and something in the game allows you to push that ending back further. See, that would be too difficult physically, I think, for anyone to do to find the card and move it. But I'm thinking if you have a track at the end and there's like a do Wait, here, anachrony. There we go. When you're playing Anachrony, you have the the doom thing that this is when the world's going to end. Right. There are certain things in the game that can move that. Right. So that's an example of it. But I was thinking like a track, right? Like here's a track from one to thirty. End game's pointing at twelve, and you can do various things to move it. Right. I know I've so seen the stuff problem like with that. that though is it takes the ra- there. There's no random. Right. Yeah, so, you do lose the random. Uh. The yeah. If yeah. So yeah, you lose the random there. A similar one would be like the Lord of the Rings, uh, the original co-op game where Sauron's constantly coming towards you. And it's based partly on how well you're doing, but also on random draws. Right. But if you're doing well enough, you can push him back. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's, that works. Yeah, yeah. Some of that, that in that, it. That, um, yeah. I mean, yeah. you could also, I, I could also see, yeah, I'm actually, I, I'm, I think I'm half designing a game in my head here. There you I'm, go. Uh, there's some, there's some strange <laughs> mechanics. I don't have any reason, reason to use them, but I've got some mechanics in my head where I'm like, Oh no, I can actually think of ways to, to make the random uh, play, but player activated deck sort of work. Um, anyway. Uh, so yeah, uh, so that is, that does seem inter- uh, somewhat unique at least. Somewhat like, like uh, th- there's definitely the one thing. Now, one of the ones that I think is fascinating, and it took me forever to figure out what game this was in, because I knew it. I'm like, I played the game that has this. I know it exists. And that's the random end after a set number of rounds in the Warhammer games, Um, at least some editions of them. 
So at least one edition of Warhammer I have, you play five rounds. At the end of that round, you roll a die. On a five or six, the game ends. Otherwise, you play another round. At the end of that round, you roll a die. On a four or five or six, it ends. If not, you play one more round, and that's the end of the game. So it does have an end limit, but it could end at random times in there. Now, I swear there's at least one edition of Warhammer that did this, where it was the round ends on a six, and that was it. It never got more popular. Like, it wasn't possible. And I think that might have been third edition Warhammer Fantasy Battle, which was known as the Champion Edition. Because the game was all about like putting Carl Franz on the thing and go trick and whatever guard bag Marslot or whatever the characters dominated everything in that and your rank and file troops basically meant nothing and that one if I remember correctly could technically go on forever like yes uh, the odds of rolling a six on a d or whatever not a six on a d six for a hundred times in a row are really low but it could technically you could have a never ending game of Warhammer now I can't confirm that I haven't kept up with Warhammer in years. But I always like the fact that you you never knew for sure when the game was going to end. And now these are games based on capturing objectives and destroying enemy troops. So it's always, do you rush to get the objectives just in case the game ends? Or do you hold back for that counterattack knowing, you know what the odds are? It's not going to end on that last turn. It'll probably go the one after. And I always thought that was fascinating. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's uh, that involving dice in your end game, on your end game timing uh, yes. is always fraught with difficulty as a designer. Uh, yeah. because you, how do you plan your, the rest of your system around not knowing when the game yeah. will end? Um, so I gotta say it's perfect for a game where you roll bucketfuls of dice for the whole thing. Absolutely. Now we're going to, we're going to jump back a little bit in the notes here. And this is actually, I think we hit this already on clue, uh, but we're right. going to bring it to a more modern game and that's tapestry. No tapestry is so hard. Cause I'm like, okay. So tapestry, there's what are five, four eras, and you have to decide when to go to each era, including the last one. And when you do that, you do a final like scoring, a final calculation of everything you get, final income. That's what it is. You do a final income, and then the game's over, but only for you. So and then, your, so you pick your end game trigger. Yes. The thing mm -hmm. is, though, it usually is when you run out of resources, but it doesn't have to be. Right. And so this is where I want to default to D in the chat room there, uh, who is our tournament level, um, our tournament tapestry level player. tapestry player. Is there a reason why you would choose to not end to, or to end the game before you are out of resources? Is there Indiana's any... already saying it, right? You, you sort of pick it, but you're stuck at the end of the game. Like right. you end the game when you can't do anything more. Right. Well, I, I mean, are, are there like our resources, a tiebreaker? Like, is there a reason you might hold off and, and, and not finish it because the points would just work out better that way? No, you want to. Okay. So no. So yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's not actually player driven. Your choices throughout the game determine yes. when you end. Now uh, those, yes. Stuff. No, no, but during the game, I totally have ended turns when I had resources to get those bonus resources for ending first and stuff like that. Right. I've definitely done it in the game, but I couldn't think of any reason at the end of the game not to just yeah. squeeze out every, yep, every little, little penny. Erg you can. Now I will say there's a bunch of games though that have the variable player ending, and it's pretty much any game where you can pass, which Tapestry is one of them, and I guess it would be a I'll call it the pass you're out, game's over for you, ending of Lost Ruins of Arnak is another example. Although there's, it's interesting because there's a sum of these games where you can uh, sort of hedge your bets. You can pass, but if not everybody passes, when it comes back around yeah. to you, you can play again. Uh, yeah, which is every auction game pretty right. much. So you can you can pass and hope that somebody else does something or everybody passes and it's over. Yeah. Um, but there's a chance to get back in. So, um, yeah, that's definitely the, but the, the, again, most of those are end round triggers. Yeah. So I shouldn't say every auction game. There are definitely auctions where you can't go back in when you pass power grid, the power grid style auction. You can't, but many, you can right. come back in. Yes. Yeah, should I spend my resources or will <laughs> I get points for them? Actually, there, there's another topic. If we're going to keep deep diving game mechanics, we should talk about is the tiebreaker mechanic. Because designers, pay attention to this. If you make something a tiebreaker, you just made it more valuable than anything else in the game. Yep. Like if gold's your tiebreaker, everyone, well, anyone who plays well is going to realize <laughs> 
if you have an equal choice, take the gold. Realize yep. you're doing that because I think some designers and playtesters miss that, that they don't even consider the the tiebreaker mechanic. That's a total side topic that maybe we'll save for another week. I really don't expect to just digest, di- dissect games for all of 2023. Hopefully we've got some really good questions that are brewing in our, from yes. our audience that are going to come in <laughs> and we'll just I, have to take those instead of just picking our own random topics that we enjoy. Yeah, well, no, this is started. This this wasn't, I think, a logical follow-up. But to be honest, I ca- we could dis- destruct, deconstruct games all year, but I think there are better qualified people to do that. And I recommend you check out, say, the Ludology podcast, for example, for <laughs> for professional game designers instead of people who just played a ton of games talking about mechanics. Not not not, not like an imposter syndrome here, but we are not game designers. I, subscribe to Jamie's blog. <laughs> oh, Jamie's blog the only is fantastic. A player and a designer is somebody put something out on uh, put something out for other people to play as well. Yeah, you have true. to play a lot of games to become a good game designer. In general, yes. Uh, so, uh, so what's another one? Um, you know what? Let, let's move on to talking about some of our favorite end game triggers. Um, I particularly picked one, but as we talk, maybe we'll come up with some other ones out of all these different end game triggers. I think my favorite is the race, but it's the race combined with the everyone gets one more turn rule that we talked about last week. Where getting X triggers the end, but you can go past X. And then once everyone goes around, it's a player who has the most that wins the game. Um, Space Base, we brought up multiple times tonight as an example of this. Russian Railroads is, I think, my favorite game of this type. And then there's also Terraforming Mars, though it's not X points, but rather getting to the end of the three tracks. Someone's going to trigger the end game and you can go past it. So I'm not sure Terraforming Mars quite fits in here, but it's definitely Space Base, Russian Railroads. I'm sure there's other ones. Those are the two that popped into my head. But I think overall, that's my favorite endgame. Fair. Uh, I have to admit, thinking on this topic, I know last week when I was talking about endgame mechanisms, uh, I was I leaned towards the bang, it's done. Everyone's, mm. you know, you, you want to you want to sneak in there and and sneak in at the end. Whereas I think when it comes to actual triggers, uh, I'm actually leaning toward the set number of turns. And this is actually because I'm frankly not all that great at games. I freely <laughs> admit I'm not the best game player in the world. Uh, and especially at the beginning. Whereas if you know you have a set number of turns, the next time you play that game, you're working with a, a, a knowledge base and you mm-hmm. know it's going to end at the same time so you can try something different. You can think about what did and didn't work and you can adjust your play style accordingly Whereas if you've got that random ending of turn, it's harder to compare play A versus play B and see what went wrong and what didn't. Yep. Um, so it, it's you're able to be more experimental in learning the game if there is a set number of turns. So I think this fits for you because you don't play the same games as often. Now that you're in Windsor, it's happening a little more, but like you're not the one playing the games five times in a row and getting to that level of mastery where I think that's where that might shift where at this point you like learning games and want to get better at games. So you want the same, you want, you want to control like when you're doing a science experiment here, you want, you want the control as the game is going to end the same way next time I play it. Right. Whereas tapestry, it's going to end differently every single time you play the game. Um, It does feel like it. It ends at different points with totally different scores. Well, and, and I mean, the big problem with the, with, uh, with tapestry is you'd have to convince someone to give you the same, uh, Oh, gee. Yeah. And even then, <laughs> there's like so many, they, there's so many random factors many variables. here. Yeah. You're, 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 you want to control for one variable and in tapestry, that's just not possible. Like, like everyone would almost have to like go up the same tracks to even try to learn <laughs> a different strategy with the same thing, which just isn't going to happen. Right. Like I, closer, like it'd be like a Terra Mystica being another example with the 13 different factions. Even if you get everyone to play the same factions, they're still going to play different because people are going to build different things first and choose different starting locations. Yeah. But at least that one has a set ending. Yeah. I would say uh, Clans of Caledonia actually has a pretty solid uh, learning uh, system. You know, if you can play the same, same clan again, you can, you can learn a lot uh, yeah. more about it every time you play. In in the single player solo uh, multiplayer co op a- 
aspect of the game, yes. When you're not trying to cut other people off and steal things other people are trying. Which, if everyone's kind of focused on their own thing, then definitely. Right. Now, my second favorite would probably be the mission-based ones. I like campaign games. I I like Gloomhaven. I like all those <laughs> games. And I love the the various... The, a better example, we're, we're going to bring up a game that we haven't brought up in quite a while, is Adventuria. I am shocked by how different that game feels each scenario all using the same mechanics every time Heck, even playing the same deck of cards with maybe one card difference is all that's changed in the deck how engaging it still is to try out different scenarios so that that's probably my number two favorite trigger is the give me a goal <laughs> at like a scenario driven goal where the next time i get a different goal but i have to use the same resources it's using that same resources it's the playing Gloomhaven and playing the next scenario with the same character who might got a little bit better, but in general, using those same resources to try to accomplish something different, which is probably why I enjoy role-playing games so much as well. Fair enough. I mean, that's kind of the, the ultimate uh, variable uh, player driven scenario uh, yes. based goal is, uh, is RPGs. So can you think of a game that you do like the end game trigger that does the immediate ending where you can, you know, pull off the big combo at the end of the game. No one was expecting. Uh, well, I know. I think last week that my uh, stop or the, the, the stop sign game um, was the we can't stop. Can't stop is one of those, but there, um, I'm trying to think. Um, I mean, Azul is close, but not quite. It's because yeah. everyone does get to, to wrap up, but you've, you've, you've triggered the end game and it's like, <laughs> you aren't going to get to pull. You aren't going to catch know, up. You're not yeah. going to catch up now. Cause I've, I, you know, they're, they're You're not getting those five there. red. Yeah, yes. exactly. Or 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 you are getting those, you know, eight red that are sitting there that are going to. Well, yeah, I, I was the, thinking uh, of getting all five red on your scoreboard. Yeah, yeah. Is the one I was thinking of is, is you're like, oh, you have that spot. You already put a blue there. I'm going to end it this round. So that yeah, doesn't yeah. clear. Um, yeah, no, I, that's that's definitely, the you know, sort of one of them that comes up. Um, the other one is, well, it's interesting. Haggis. Uh, which is a, a trick-taking game we play uh, on BGA. Uh, you trigger... So the first person who's uh, done with their cards is out, but the other two keep playing for second place. Mm. Or whoever else, you know, whoever else is okay. playing yeah, yeah. plays for second and third place. But you trigger your end game uh, by playing your last card before anyone else. But they can't go past you? Uh, they won't get more score. Their score can't go up, go, okay. go beyond you. Yeah, uh, no. But again, so that's, that's interesting. Yeah. So the, um, oh, that yeah, but that's actually end round. That's not end game. Yeah, yeah. That's what so, I was trying to figure out. Yeah, is yeah that... no, that's. Why? Well, I'm, I'm trying to remember what the actual end. Of my... <laughs> I, it's a, I think it's a point. I think it's. A, I think it's a point race. A point I think uh, I'd have to double check the rules. So one, one we talked about last week that I don't know how that falls in here is um the 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 game ends when no one can move. We hadn't talked about so there's a mm. different type. So uh, hey, that's my fish um battle sheep um what's another one uh corridor is that the one yeah well what about no so arguably chess can get into that right yes you can get into that yeah chess actually the... when i was researching this chess has two end games mm -hmm. one is capture the piece which this particular article called out as a type of game so strategio you got to capture the thing risk if you capture or not risk a strategio if you capture the flag i think it is in strategio they brought up capturing the 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 um king in chess and almost all of these games also had a side end condition of or it results in tie if no one can make any moves so so chess technically it's not you can't make any moves but um stalemate right like there's no now the one that is the end game condition is your opponent can't make a move is checkers i mm -hmm. guess is is one of the very i guess that pro checker players don't tend to eliminate each other they tend to get to a point where the one player can't move anymore right uh, and Haggis is 350 points for those wondering. So that's, a, that's just a point to <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like a Racco or whatever, yeah, right? Yeah. You just keep playing. Uh, what's Racco? Goal? Yeah, it's point, point total. Well, it's, it's points, point. but okay, what, what's the what's the round trigger? Goal? I guess it'd be goal, right? Get your cards in order? Yeah. I'm just wondering. See there, round triggers, round end triggers it's could tri be a it's whole... Play, it's, it's player triggered though, right? Because you decide. Yeah, but you if if you get it, you get it and you win. Like if you miss it, that's you playing the game wrong. Well, <laughs> that's not. Yeah, but you can't be like, oh, I think I have it. You have it. Or you don't. It's well, yeah, it's, but you don't have to get them all in order. 
Yeah, you do. Oh yeah, yeah, you do. Okay, I was trying. Yeah, to, you I was do. thinking. I was thinking you could. Yeah, no. You're that right. would be an interesting variant that you yeah. could call it early if you think you have enough points. You have more than everyone else, <laughs> right? That'd be an, that'd be a, okay, there. You go. We might have came up with a gamer's variant of Racco, <laughs> where you can call just Rack instead of Racco, and <laughs> and and you actually you actually call it. Yes, too, too, <laughs> DNS. To be playing Racco. Yes, you you either have Racco or you're too drunk to be playing Racco. Oh. Technically, you lose the game if you turn around your rack and it's right. All right. Well, I think uh, we're pretty sure I'm pretty sure we're at the trigger to end this topic. Fair enough. So we would love to hear about your favorite game end game triggers in the comments below. In a moment, we're also going to be checking in with our chat room here on Twitch to see what they have to say. Now, the audio of that, uh, for those who can't be here live, does go out to our Patreon backers at the hotel guest level or higher, which you can support us at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. And before we do go to the lobby, just a reminder that we are here to answer your gaming and game night questions. Sometimes we take two episodes to cover a full topic because we get so involved. You can send questions to us by going to tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on Ask the Bellhop, emailing mo at no, sorry, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Actually, Mo will work too. But questions is technically where they get filtered. Uh, or you can send uh, us a DM or hit us up on social media. Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Welcome to our review of Drop It by Cosmos, a physics-based game with more depth than you would think. Now, Drop It was designed by Bernhard Lack and Uwe Rapp originally published in North America by Cosmos in 2018, with a second edition that came out in 2019. Now, the second edition is the version I own, with the only actual difference being a Parents' Choice Silver Award logo put on the corner of the box. Now, Drop It plays two to four players, more with the team play variant, with games taking about a half an hour. The box lists the age requirement at eight and up, but I don't see any real reason younger kids couldn't play as long as keep an eye on where the pieces are going in their mouth. Yeah. In Drop It, players take turns dropping squares, triangles, circles, and diamonds of their own color into a vertical game board, a, a tray of sorts. They then get points for how up, how far up the tray that shape ends, as well as if it's getting any um, special bonuses by touching a special bonus circle. Now, the trick here, though, is your P scores zero points if it touches a matching shape or color, which also includes the bands on the bottom and sides of the tray. Now, for a look at what you get with this unique dexterity game, check out our Drop It unboxing video on YouTube. Now, overall, the component quality here is awesome, with painted birch wood pieces, a solid tray and base, and ridiculously thick Cardboard, scoreboard, and counters. There are also wooden blocks in each player color for tracking your score. Now, the one thing of note here is that the box insert was clearly designed to keep these game components safe, uh, especially the main gameplay tray. Now, my particular insert, as you can see in the unboxing video, was a little beat up due to this, which to me just meant it was doing its job. This is great, but I can see some game collectors being put off by having a damaged insert. So if you like your games in pristine condition, this may not be the game for you. Expect a little bit of things having moved around and a little bit of crumpled cardboard. Nice, solid components. Great table presence. Let's now move on to how the game plays. So you start by dividing up the pieces. With four pieces, it's simple. Everyone just grabs all the pieces of one color. With two, you grab all the pieces of two colors. But with three, you end up splitting the leftover color between the players. Players place their scoring marker on the zero spot on the scoring track, and someone assembles the board by choosing a restriction and configuring the sides and base of that drop area. Now, each turn, players choose one of their shapes and drop it into the tray. Then, depending on where it lands, they may or may not score points. No points are awarded if it's touching anything of the same shape or color, which includes the previously dropped pieces, as well as the bottom and edges of the board. If you had a safe drop, you get points based on the maximum height reached and bonus points if touching any of the bonus point circles. Play then passes to the next player until all players have played all of their pieces and the player with the most points wins. One thing to note is that only the current drop matters. Mm -hmm. It's only the piece that was just dropped 
that is used to calculate points earned that turn. The fact that other pieces are going to shift, bounce, and move around has no impact on game score. Now, in addition to these basic rules, there are four variant ways to play. The first is easy mode. You just ignore the bottom and edge pieces. Pretty simple. Next, the opposite sides of the edge pieces. So the default gameplay is you're looking at colors along the edges. You can swap those to shapes instead of colors. Another option is to play drop it in teams. This can extend the game past four players. Each team gets two colors and share pieces at a single score. Now the final variant is our favorite and it involves joker tiles. Each player gets two joker tiles, which can be spent after any drop to score a piece that otherwise wouldn't. If a player does manage to get to the end of the game with any of these jokers left, they're going to get three bonus points per tile left over. Now that's really all there is to it. It sounds mm -hmm. simple, but picking what piece to play when can be huge. Now I first got to play Drop It at Queen City Conquest in Buffalo, New York back in 2018, and I've been meaning to get a copy since. Back then, Sean and Deanna got to play it before me and actually taught me to play between RPG sessions. This was one of those wow moments, much like Gokuku. Uh, it's a game that, almost, that looks almost childish, but mm. as you start playing, the depth rapidly emerges and you discover just how much thought and some degree of skill is required to play this game well. Yeah, even back then, I was smitten with the game and that hasn't changed. While Drop It might not look like much, there is a lot more going on here than it looks like there is. What I love most about Drop It is that it actually requires a good amount of logic, tactics, and strategy. Picking which piece to drop when, what pieces to use up early in the game, and which to save for later, and when to use your jokers, if using the optional rule, are all interesting, fun decision points. This is combined with the fun of watching what happens when you drop a piece and then being surprised when things don't go as you expect or delighted when a drop goes perfectly. Luckily, physics works the same for everyone, so the delights and anguishes are shared universally. Now, everyone I've played this game with has noted on their first play that these pieces just don't move how you'd expect. Added to this is the brilliant design of the base tray, the board. The fact it tapers outwards really helps make each drop more interesting, and doing moves like hugging the cover corners way more difficult than you'd expect. So the play area is actually a trapezoid, with the top and bottom being parallel, and the usable play area is actually widest at the bottom, not the mm -hmm. top. Now the scoring system is also really done well done in this game because it pushes you to take risks in order to get that just little bit higher into that next level or making sure your piece lands on one or more bonus circles. Once you played a couple rounds, you also start to pay attention to what colors and shapes the other players have, which can lead to some really cutthroat plays, especially later in the game. It is all too easy to be stuck with a piece at the end and no hope of scoring due to the shapes and colors exposed. Now we played the game multiple times in multiple different configurations and all the ways to play are fun. There is not a wrong or bad way to play drop. It. In the end though, we all seem to prefer playing with the colored sides of the boards and the Joker tiles. What I like most about the Jokers, they can offset a mistake as well as make a dead round more, in, more interesting. Instead of being dead, you get some points. But I also love the fact that if you can play well enough to avoid that situation, those jokers turn into some much needed bonus points, which could win you the game. The dead round one is a big one for me. I mean, mistakes of the bad drop type happen, though to some degree, they're going to happen less the more and more experienced you become. But getting yourself into a bad position later in the game with no opportunity to score is a potential. And the mm -hmm. joker takes away some of the stink of that. Now, I do have a couple of minor issues with Drop It, and they're both design choices. Now, the biggest one is the shape side of the edge boards. The shapes on these are rather small, and each of them is crossed out with a big X, and that X is actually bigger than the shape, which makes some of the shapes hard to see, especially on some of the narrower bands on the scoring areas. Right. The color side is far more clear, but the shape side is certainly one where you want to pause and double check as it's not obvious at a quick glance. 
Yeah, I almost wish they just removed the X's. Like, you know that those are shapes you're not allowed to touch. Why put an X on them? Now, my next complaint is with the Joker tiles. They are just thick enough that they kind of look like the wood and they kind of look like you should be dropping them on the board along with the other pieces. But they're also just thick enough that they are thicker than wood and can get stuck. Now, I got to say, this isn't going to be a problem for most groups and especially most groups of adults, but could be a problem if you play with small kids. Uh, even my youngest daughter, who's not all that small, uh, actually immediately when I passed her a joker at the start of the round, started reaching to drop it in to kind of see what happened. And I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> I mean, it's a valid investigative goal, but yeah, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Design-wise, I have one very ma uh, minor quibble, and that's how loosely the color and shape set up game pieces, both in the sides and bottom, fit. I'm not sure why they're as remarkably loose a fit as they are, but depending on how you're passing it around or moving it around or or when you're dumping it at the end between rounds, uh, they fall out. They just go fly. They go flying. They they mm -hmm. aren't held in at all. Yeah, there's nothing to hold those on. If you flip the thing, not only are all the pieces going to come out, your sideboards are going to come out as well. Now, gameplay wise, I can see one potential problem with this game that kind of came up in in our plays but we're not overly competitive and where it's going to be a problem where it wasn't a problem for us is if you are playing with highly competitive players and that's the rare edge case where you can't quite tell if a piece should score does it reach a higher level or is it or isn't touching a scoring bonus or is it or isn't touching something of the same shape or color like they're really close and it's resting or are they touching or not or has it quite reached up and what I recommend is if you do play with highly competitive players, the thing is, talk about this before you play your first game. Like, does a piece have to be past the level line or just touching it to count for more points? Now, we've always used the friendly debate option where if it looks close, give it to the player. It's more fun that way. Just give them the points. Yeah, yeah, it's close enough. Yeah, they don't look like they're touching. Just go for it. Now, the one trick we did find, especially for to see if peaches are touching, is to put a piece of white paper behind the board or something lighter than the board. And then if you can see the paper through it, they're not touching. This does make it way easier to see potential gaps. Yeah, it's the vertical score level that is the biggest concern for me. As Mo said, a sheet of paper solves the gap issue, really. But the scoring lines have a thickness. Mm -hmm. We have already seen cases where pieces are clearly on the line but don't extend above the line, but they're on the line inside mm -hmm. that thickness. Uh, so I second the recommendation to clarify this situation up front. And to be frank, I find it disappointing that the rules didn't account for this. And another thing to be aware of this in this game is because of the thickness of the plastic, your viewing angle will adjust mm. where you think things are. And you basically have to go down to get to eye level to notice whether something's above or below the line. There is and ref with refraction. <laughs> yes, is a thing. Uh, with, with playing with four players of different heights, it was shocking to see how different, say, Cat viewed the world than I did when playing Drop It. <laughs> Overall, I love Drop It when I played it back in 2018, and I love it just as much, if not more now. Back when I first played, I didn't know there were variant rules. I didn't know there were Joker tiles. I even know that was a thing. And I got to say the best way to play at this point, as far as I'm concerned, is four players with the Jokers. Though I also dig the fact that we can play with more to four by breaking into teams, which is going to make this game fantastic for public play events, as it already has the table presence to draw in the, oh, what are you doing crowd? And be able to say, well, why don't you join Sean's team? You get the next drop is going to be awesome for getting people involved. Now, one note about three players. Since you're separating that fourth color into three separate sets, not everyone gets the same shapes. Yes. This could potentially be a problem if people have favorite shapes or see some advantage with shape X over shape Y. I would personally avoid three-player games with those highly competitive types for that reason. That are possibly throwing a drafting mechanic where players pick which of those shapes or something. So at least it's in their hands and not an arbitrary. The rule book says take these shapes. Right. Now, due to the amount of depth in this game, I actually think Drop It is going to appeal to a wide range of gamers despite its toy-like look. 
there are some really solid decision points in this game, and there is skill required to play well. And unlike many dexterity games, that skill is not much more about choosing the right piece than performing the physical act of dropping well. Yeah, initial rotation angle, position, shape, color, and then potentially force and spin are all player controllable aspects, mm -hmm. which interact with the board setup and previous objects in fun and interesting ways. So I will recommend do not take a small disc and flick it from the top. The game's not designed to handle that well. Um, though there's nothing in the rules that says you can't. It was also later in the game when you did that. So there was yes, it was <laughs> less room for it to, to go. Yes, it, we, we had an interesting thing happen. I wish someone had got it on video. Maybe I'd be TikTok famous at this point. Now, everyone I've shown this game to has loved it. I have n not seen anyone disappointed or not enjoy this game. And I don't expect that to change. This is also a fantastic game for playing in public. This is going to catch people's attention. This is going to draw a crowd. I can already hear strangers saying, what's this? What are you doing? What are you trying to? Oh, so you're trying to like, I can hear those conversations happening. Now, while in some ways, uh, as it says, like Go Cuckoo as a fun game for all ages, but I would say Drop It is actually more accessible. Mm -hmm. The steady hands and dexterity aren't as big a requirement. If yes. you're able to pick up a shape, then you can play Drop It. Yeah, this is why I think even younger kids could play this. And, and man, talk about a learning tool for learning shapes and colors. And, and matching shapes like I I'd honestly like I think we would have been playing this with our kids probably as young as we played games with them pair up with a parent so you can go no no why wouldn't you want to choose that one well you don't want to touch that one the other thing is I think heavy gamers should give this game a shot due to that the 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 logic required the actual strategy of what do I play next and uh, I don't want to use that word. Um, stabbing your opponents in the back and taking that that move to prevent them from playing. And notice, oh, Sean has squares left and it's yellow. And look what's on that edge. I'm going to just drop a square over here. It'll get me three, but it'll make sure he gets none. Yeah. But once you allow for the rules, as we mentioned above, I would say this game can really scale with competitiveness. Mm -hmm. There are so many variables you can consider or you can just grab a piece, check the colors and shapes, drop it in. And even if you play this game 10 times in a row, you're still going to take a turn where you drop a triangle on a triangle because you didn't notice. I am personally super happy to have a copy of Drop It in my collection. I expect this game to get a lot of play in the coming years. Just kind of wish I'd picked it up earlier. Well, that's it for our look at Drop It, a unique dexterity game that requires more skill than you would think and not in the physical dexterity way most games like this do. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed this review. I welcome you to also check out the written version over at tabletopbellhop.com. Welcome to our review of Thrones of Valeria, a modern trick-taking card game for up to six players. Before we get too far in, we need to take a moment to thank Daily Magic Games for sending us review copies of their new small box Valeria games, including this one. Thrones of Valeria was designed by Matt Jacob and features artwork from the awesome Miko. This game, along with two other small box Valeria games, as Sean just mentioned, were funded on Kickstarter and published by Daily Magic Games in 2022. Now, at this point, some people did get their games by the end of 2022, but it should be hitting retail stores now, with most backers already received their copy, if not all of them. I was not a backer, so I can't see the exact fulfillment, but I know most people have gotten their games. Now, Thrones of Valeria plays two to six players with games taking anywhere from half an hour to over an hour, depending on the player count. Mm -hmm. It's listed for eight plus, which seems about right to us, and has an MSRP of $30 USD. Now, Throne of Valeria is a two to six player, potentially team based, two round trick taking card game. Unique twists on trick taking mechanics include ranked suits, where the rank can change mid hand, three ranked jester cards, which can act as either the highest or lowest cards, unique card abilities for every card value, and a victory condition based on gold collected and not tricks won or lost. Check out our Thrones of Valeria unboxing video on YouTube to get a look at the components you get in this modern trick-taking card game.
Now, in addition to nice, well-made linen finished deck of cards, you also get five Mahjong style tiles, uh, tile like guild tokens, a bag to pull these from at the start of the game, silver and gold tokens and cardboard, and a very clear and concise rule book with lots of examples. The cards themselves feature line art from the Miko that is quite busy and card information is only presented in the top left of each card. Mm -hmm. The cards are also designed to look well used and worn. You get cards numbered one to nine in five different suits, as well as three jester cards. The card artwork on each value is unique, and each of the three jesters get their own artwork. You also get a set of six summary cards that do a great job mm -hmm. of giving you an overview of play and a list of various card abilities. Now, this small box game has a cardboard trough style insert mainly meant to protect the game during shipping. So it does work well enough to hold everything once you've punched everything and sorted it out. We personally keep all the coins in the bag with the guild tokens and just take them out before playing, then toss the cards into a baggie just to keep them from sliding all over the place. Overall, the physical component quality here is excellent, but we don't love the artwork direction on the cards. But more about that after an overview of play. So you start a game of Thrones of Valeria by placing the board in the center of the table and seating it with guild tokens pulled from the bag. The cards are shuffled, and players are dealt a hand of cards with the number being determined by player count. So play starts with the player who holds the highest card of the top suit on the guild track, which is usually the nine. That player can then lead any card they wish. It doesn't have to be that top card. Now each card has an ability based on its value. As soon as the card is played, that ability activates and must be used. Mm -hmm. These abilities include, uh, in order of card value from one to nine, move any guild to the bottom of the ranking, steal two coins from another player, gain three coins from the bank, swap the rank of two guilds, draw the cards from the draw draw cards from the deck and select one to keep, get six gold if this card wins a trick, gain a gold from the bank and discard a card, lock or unlock a guild, or lo locked guilds can't change in their rank. And move a guild up two ranks. Now, the Jester cards each have the ability to be the highest rank card in play, but only if you pay a cost in gold equal to the card's rank. Remember, there's one to three ranks. These cards can also be played as a zero if you choose not to play the cost. Now, one easily missed rule is that you cannot lead a Jester unless you have no other option. Now, in typical trick-taking style, the first card is led, everyone, after the first card is led, everyone else must follow suit if they can. If they can't, they can play any card from their hand. The trick is won by the highest card played from the highest ranked guild. Mm -hmm. This is trickier than it sounds because guilds can, and do, fluctuate during a, a hand. Now, when thinking of this game in terms of traditional trick-taking games, Basically, every guild trumps all the guilds under it, with the jesters trumping all the guilds, but only if they're paid for. A player who won the trick then gets gold based on the rank of the guilds for the card they played. This gold reward ranges from five to negative three. Yes, mm -hmm. this means you can lose gold by winning a trick, which is a big part of the game and how it works. You continue to play tricks until one player is out of cards at the end of a hand. Note, due to the fact there's a card that lets you draw additional cards and the card that lets you uh, gives you a gold and has you discard, it's actually common for different players to have varying amount of cards throughout the round and the end round trigger changing. Now once, the, now, once the first round ends, you gather all of the cards, including any cards left in a player's hand, shuffle them and deal out a second hand. The guild rankings stay the same as they were at the end of the first round of play, and you play a full second round. Mm -hmm. At the end of the second round, the player with the most gold wins. Now, what we just described are the standard rules that work for three to six players. Thrones of Valeria can also be played as a two-player trick-taking game. When playing this way, each player is dealt a hand of 20 cards. They then split this into two 10-card decks, which they then use to play through each round. The first set in the first round and the second set in the second round. Now, another option when you have an even number of players is to play a team game. Players each have their own hands, but share a pile of gold between them. 
and it's the pair with the most gold at the end that wins the game. This is the recommended play way to play with four or six players. Now that's what the rule book recommends, but it's also what I personally would recommend having played a number of rounds of the standard game at different player counts and also trying the game team-based. Team-based to me is the way to go if you can. Now it sounds like we're on to some final thoughts on Thrones of Valeria. So trick-taking games are a part of growing up in southwestern Ontario. I've been playing some form of tricking card game, tricking card game, trick-taking card game for as long as I can remember. Heck, right now, my mom is at a Euchre Club, currently playing a trick-taking card game for money. Around these parts, trick-taking is just ubiquitous. So especially in French communities, often people grew up playing these games with family, found communities at school to play them with, and grew up playing them at local places like churches or community halls. Yeah, it's pretty easy to say that most people around here, including us, are trick-taking fans as are the people who we played this game with. Frankly, it would be pretty hard to find people who enjoyed games, but didn't enjoy trick-taking games in these parts. Yeah, I actually don't know anyone offhand who doesn't enjoy trick-taking. So the big thing here, though, is what's different? What sets us apart? So Thrones of Valeria introduces a number of new things to trick-taking, which actually can be a bit much for someone who's only used to traditional playing cards. The biggest adjustment I found was the fact that the suits have ranks and those ranks change, and that determines what card beats another card. This concept can be hard to remember, even after multiple plays, and even now, we often have a surprise player at the table who thought they took a trick but didn't because the rank shifted, or totally thought someone else was taking a trick but now they have to take it because, you know, they used an assassin, which actually put the rank of their assassin above the thing they assassinated, so they ended up taking a trick. The thing is, though, once you've figured out this ranking system and its impact on play, it really does shine and leads to some really interesting hands. It honestly might be easier if you didn't have preconceived ideas about Trump and suits going in, uh, as you wouldn't have to mentally shift from a fixed to a more changing Trump concept. I think there's a reason this game specifically avoided the use of the term Trump so that they're not getting people stuck in that euchre, these cards are higher than these cards all the time kind of thought. And then, you know, the lead suit is, is automatically the Trump and stuff like that. Now, another big change, which is tied to this, is the card abilities. These are pretty quick to pick up. Um, the iconography on the cards does a good job of reminding you what each card does. And it didn't take us many games before we could all leave the reference cards in the box and everyone had pretty much internalized what the cards do. For example, writing this review, I was able to note down the full list of what everything did without having to check the card to make sure I was right. Now, while some reference cards of late have been wanting, these were certainly not. They were clear, concise, and really helped as you were slowly learning and memorizing the cards. Now, I will admit, everyone I've taught the game does use the cards a lot when they first start off. Now, the final change in this compared to any other uh, trick-taking game I've ever played, including modern and old ones, is that victory condition of having the most gold. Due to the fact that winning a trick could actually mean losing points rather than gaining them means you aren't playing to win every trick, which can be quite the adjustment for traditional card game players. I personally love this aspect of the game, but I, and I've also been told that it is possible to win this game without taking a single trick, so I've yet to see that in any of our games. I really dug this change, though it can be easy to forget in the heat of the moment with so much going on, just trying to get in there and win tricks you might be better casting off on. Now, mechanically, Thrones of Valeria takes a bit to learn, but it's extremely enjoyable once you do. And a bit doesn't mean five plays like some other games we've reviewed in the past where it takes a level of system mastery. It just takes a couple rounds to get into the differences here from other trick-taking games. Now, each of the changes I just mentioned synchronize to make a fascinating game of cards with a nice short playing time that's just short enough that players are often begging to play a second round. Now, I said mechanically there for a reason, because we have found some issues with the physical aspects of the game. There are some graphic design choices made here for the final production copy of the game that honestly just don't make a lot of sense. Indeed, and this is made more frustrating by how good the game is to play. Mm -hmm. In some cases, you need to push past these issues to thoroughly enjoy the game. 
Now, the first thing and the biggest thing that I noticed right when unboxing the game, being a longtime card player, is the information on the cards isn't flipped. I, why? Why, when you make a game, especially when you're going with a trick taking game based on traditional cards, you didn't make it flippable? You can only splay the cards when they're all face up. I found this really annoying. Even my kids complain having to constantly flip cards over at the start of each hand. They're like, oh, it's like every other card's upside down. And this was present in the prototype as well. There has, for whatever reason, been a top and a bottom to these cards all along, at least throughout the public versions. Next is the color choices. Now, this may also be a problem for color blindness. I'm not talking about that. Neither Sean or I or anyone I played the game with has that problem. Without any color-based vision issues, we all found the yellow and the silver or white, I'm not sure which color that you consider gray, cards hard to read. Not just on the table, like from across the table, but holding in them in your hand. Some of these are hard to tell apart. The three and the eight, for example. Now, interestingly, if you look up close, and I can't remember who noticed this, you can see that the numbers have a white outline, but they're on a white background, which just seems like an odd choice. Like all these needed to fix was a stroke one filter in Photoshop. Like, like I could have fixed this one myself. I don't know if they use Photoshop to design these cards, but there has to be an equivalent in whatever they did use to design these cards. Yeah, the white silver in particular, you really had to look at in some light to see that number at all. Yes. Now, I will admit, after multiple plays, what I learned to look at is the icons because each of the values does the same thing. So I notice if it locks, it's an eight, not a three. If it lets me collect three cards, but we shouldn't have to get to that point. Now, similarly, we found the blue and green guild symbols hard to see the symbol on due to color. Now, again, no one has color blindness, so all of us can go, well, that's blue, that's green, we're fine. But I can totally see that if you could not tell the blue and green apart, you also wouldn't be able to tell them apart by the symbols, because the symbols over the colors are just not dark enough or light enough. I don't even know which way it should go. Yeah, realistically, I think the guild symbol just needs to be darker. The lines are not black, so they don't have as much contrast with the surrounding color as they need to. I just put that white outline on the symbols and the black outline on. <laughs> now, one that totally doesn't affect gameplay at all, but I just happened to notice when I was taking pictures for a recent gameplay is that the card backs are designed to look worn. But the worn bits aren't where your fingers would hold the cards. And it honestly, to me, looks like they printed the card backs upside down. This was something I hadn't noticed at all, and is perhaps the least problematic of the issues, as it in no way no. impacts card play, except that it might push you towards picking up your cards the wrong way when looking at them face down. That's so, true. Because there is a top and a bottom, if you look at it and think, oh, that's the bottom of the card, and pick it up and hold it that way, it's going to be upside down for you. Maybe that's my kid's problem. I have to, I have to teach them how to pick the cards up from the backs, and it might be better. Now, sticking with that whole worn card look, this is also a problem on the front of the cards. The problem here is the cards look dirty. They look like they need to be wiped down with a damp cloth or something. Now, this one didn't bother me as much, except for the fact that that color of background didn't go well with some of the colors of the fonts. But Sean actually found this bothered you well, like you found this bothered you while you were playing the game. Yeah, I, I don't know if I had have some sort of compulsion that I wasn't aware of, but I found it wildly distracting. Maybe I'm just conscious of trying to be nice to other people's game components, but I just wanted to clean them. It really looks like dirty, nasty fingers have smeared crud all over the cards. Maybe we finally found a game where you might as well use those Cheetos because the cards are already look kind of nasty. I don't know. Uh, now, my final issue is the artwork itself. And, and this one honestly has been mixed. Some players dig it. Some don't like it. I just think it's an interesting choice. I think it looks very unique, though, compared to other Valeria games. And I probably wouldn't have as much of a concern with it. Or, uh, I, I wouldn't. I'd like it more if I hadn't seen the prototype on the Kickstarter. Because the prototype artwork is full color Miko art that looks like what we've seen in previous Valeria games, especially going all the way back to Card Kingdoms. That's what's there. These, though, look very stylistic, very angled line drawings with splashes of color, which is not what I expect from a Valeria game. Now, while I do quite like the art, it doesn't say Valeria. It's beautiful, as we would expect from the Miko. 
but it's not what I expect from a Valeria game. Mm -hmm. And we've played quite a few of those. I think most will admit. Now, as Mo mentioned, having seen the prototype art on Board Game Geek, it looks very much like a Valeria game and would have gone a long way to making this game feel like it was part of the Valeria world. Which is our final issue with Thrones of Valeria. I, there's really nothing here tying this game to the Valeria universe. There's no ground on these five different guilds. They're just different suit colors. The artwork doesn't tie in with the other games. And while battling monsters has just been a Valeria thing, game for, thing from the beginning, where's some monsters to fight? Like, of all these new small box Valeria game, this one feels the least Valeria-like. Like, this is could have been any theme, and the game would still work. Absolutely. A fantastic game that someone slapped the Valeria name on and made sure four established guild colors matched, but then added an extra guild. See, that last one should have just been the red for the monsters, and then at least there'd be something... I still think the guilds should have been the four citizen types that have been present in most of the Valeria games, with the fifth being the monsters. But whatever, choices were made. The thing is, like, I, these are complaints. Yes, they are complaints. They're the, but they're complaints about the graphic design and art choices that are all washed away by how well Thrones of Valeria plays. This is one of the best modern trick-taking games I've played. Everyone from my youngest daughter to her grandmother have enjoyed playing it. It was a hit with my usable grain group as well as my family. I can 100% live with the dirt. It really is that good of a trick-taking game. Now, my favorite way to play Thrones of Valeria is the team-based version. This method of play helps negate any bad hand problems while adding that fun, interesting level of player interaction that you can't find without playing with a teammate. This is what switches this from a good, possibly even great, to an even better taking game so some people may find the mitigation of problems to soften the game a bit too much while i think for euchre players in particular it's a very familiar concept yeah. it, it does it makes the game feel i don't know more rewarding in a way and and more we did it together it's again euchre versus hearts for example for, for two traditional card games now my least favorite way to play is the two-player game so I can totally see how this could appeal to some gamers. Two-player Thrones of Valeria is super strategic, as you have to select both your hands for both rounds of play before you start. The only thing you get to see is those guild ranks. In this version, all but eight cards start in play, which makes this a dream for the card counters out there. Personally, I have a hard time enough trying to remember what I played the first round of a hand, the first trick in a given round, let alone remembering what the 10 cards I put aside for next round were, let alone what must be left in my opponent's hand. Like, by the time you get to that, you know, three cards left in the fourth round, I have no clue what anyone has except for those cards in my hand. Yeah, I accept that some publishers are going to try and maximize player counts for all games now, but sometimes it's too much of a stretch. There are trick-taking games out there specifically designed for two players. Mm -hmm. We've reviewed them. We like them. I don't need another one shoehorned in. I gotta say, this does feel like those other games in a way because it plays so different from the base game. I almost wonder if they could have sold it as a standalone two-player game. Now, the other thing is Thrones of Valeria does work well three to six players with the standard rules. I have no problem playing with them, but I just found... That once I tried it with teams, I'm like, oh, I'd prefer not to play with teams. If I, if, if teams is an option, I'm going to play with teams. If you enjoy trick-taking games at all, you need to pick up Thrones of Valeria. I, I don't even think you need to try it. You don't, you don't have to play it anywhere. I don't know if there's like a tabletop simulator you can try. You don't need to. Just go buy it. If you like trick-taking games, specifically Euchre, if you like the Euchre team-based play, go get this game. This is a fantastic modern take on classic trick-taking mechanics with some fascinating twists. So the only caveat being, if you have vision or colorblindness issues, check yeah. a copy in advance before purchasing, because that could be one deal breaker here for some people, and that is its accessibility. Now, if trick-taking isn't your jam, you probably haven't listened this long, but I'm not sure if there's anything groundbreaking enough here to win you over. Yes, it's doing some new stuff, but it's still a trick-taking game. 
So it might be worth giving a shot if you like games with more strategy and tactics. There is more of that going on here. You might even have fun trying to be that first person who wins without taking any tricks. <laughs> there is no shoot the moon rule for that. If, if you can get through, like, it's not like hearts where if, you know, take all of the bad suit or is that spades? That's hearts, right? If you take all the hearts, you, you gain points instead of losing them. Now, where I think this game is going to be a hidden gem is the deep thinking two player abstract strategy players. Because playing Thrones of Valeria two player feels like a chess match. Trying to outthink your opponent using knowledge of what cards you've seen to predict what your opponent will play. I know a couple of local gamers I think will adore this as a two player experience. And if that's your jam, you may just be in luck. Personally, I'll be sticking with four or six team games. And last week, you only get three or five players, then I'm happy to play a standard game. Well, that wraps up our review of Thrones of Valyria. If you have played this game or pick it up later, please stop by and let us know what you thought. I, I and now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games I, we played since last episode. We might have to end the episode here because Mo just broke. <laughs> Mo just crashed. Oh, I don't even know. But how it's, I drank some water in between my coffees. Like, wow. That was bleh. I, I, I would say say the word scramble thing, but that's another podcaster's meme. <clears throat> All right. Starting off. Smash up Disney with the girls. Three players, just me and the girls. First time playing any smash up game for them. Gwen loved it. She loved the option. She loved the 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 trying to puzzle out the card combos, and there was an awesome progression of her going, these decks suck together, why did I pick these? I thought this one was supposed to be easy to, oh, I totally see how these decks could work together, and man, I want to play again with the same decks because I think I found some cool things to do. The problem is my daughter is very analytical, which I appreciate, and it's partly why she's got great grades and other things like that, which is great, but she takes so long to play games. I have complained about her AP before, I have never seen AP to the level she displayed while trying to play Smash Up. And she had not gotten to the moment, and I didn't even want to mention it to her, where she was even considering what other cards players had. Just trying to figure out her hand of cards and how her deck worked took way too long. Now, the problem with that was my youngest daughter got bored. And despite pod prodding and pushing and whatever... I think there was a glimmer of hope for Genevieve where, where she pulled off a couple combos and was proud of herself. And she was really digging the Disney and the art and she was need noticing how the powers were thematic to the movies. Like, I think there was a chance that she may have loved this game, but the AP just crushed her. Like it, it, I, and I can't blame her. Uh, I was playing patient dad, but getting very frustrated. Yeah. And this is, this is tough because you don't want to quash the instinct to plan and analyze and think. Yeah. Uh, you, you never want to, um, you know, push the 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 um, girl narrative. The you know any of the you know Pink's got a great song, "Stupid Girls." Uh, you never want to you never want to do that. You never want to push anyone in that direction. You want to encourage the deep thought, but at the same time, there is a time and a place. Um, yeah. And and I suspect that the the better option in your case, um, aside from maybe just sitting down and having a chat away from board games, um, well, we've done that part. <laughs> may just be a timer. Now it can't be a short timer. You have to give her enough time to at least analyze things to some mm -hmm. degree, but stop it from getting to the point where everyone just wants to go and have coffee and popcorn yeah. and come back later to see if it's their turn yet. And what it was, too, is it was bad enough that it was leading to other players having AP because they would forget what they were planning on doing. And she's also bad for the not planning on her turn because things will change. And I'm like, no, you need to come up with a plan. And then if things change, change it. You can't sit there and go, well, what card she plays may change my whole thing. Well, there's also a chance it won't. Right. And I was yeah. trying to get that across to her. I don't know. It's difficult. Like, like we've had conversations like Deanna likes to analyze and we'll use AP. And that's why she loves playing on board game arena is she can take four hours to plan out her move if she wants. And she likes that, but she fully understands that when playing with other people, 
eventually you give yourself so much time. And when it looks like people are getting impatient, you make the best move you've come up with at that point. And we're trying to get her to find that balance of, but she's like, but I know it's not the best move. There's probably something better and I'm missing it. And I need to figure that out. Well, and then, then like I said, then, I'm finding that hard to kind of quash. And, and I think what needs to be expressed to her is, okay, there may be a better move that you haven't found yet, but that's your goal for next turn because yeah. you've run out of time. So next time your, your goal for this game is to find a way to work out your combinations faster. Yeah. Um, you know, you're good at the game. You're good at the thinking. So now your skill, you know, the, you know, the mm. skill you need to work on is figuring out the things faster. Now, um, another thing I'd thought of that may work, especially with smash up is if I'm planning to play a game with her, possibly give her the game ahead of time. Give her the that deck, way she can look she through the decks and look through and learn what they do and come up with a combo. But I kind of feel like that's going to give her an unfair advantage once we actually sit down <laughs> playing. So I'm well, not sure yeah, there's there's at, at that level. Like at this point, none of us are smash up experts. If we'd all played a ton of games. Like if she sat down to play race for the galaxy, I could see totally doing that. Cause I have enough experience with race. I'll, I'll be able to, to counter it, but like, I don't know, but I'm thinking, you know, here, here's your pick your decks. You want to play in smash up tomorrow and, you know, go do what you do <laughs> and read through them and come up with combos, but don't get too frustrated if you can't kill Simba, because that's important for your strategy. If the card doesn't come up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's, it's, I, I, to me, it's also the, you know, people who go online and look up board game strategies to me that yeah. ruins someone to me, a lot of the fun of board games is discovering how to play while you're playing. Right. Playing, playing at, as you're playing is, is learning as, as you're fun playing as, 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 yeah. as, you know, playing the best possible, yeah. you know, you which is wanna... why I'm not a chess master. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Next one. Moving on. Thrones of Laria, three player cat. And Deanna, well, Tori was out picking up tacos. Went really well. Um, very fast with three players who know trick taking. Uh, the fun part here was just Kat played probably more euchre than I ever have. She definitely grew up. It's a being small town, I think, goes along with being French. Um and and we just flew through. Like we probably could have got two games in, which is kind of cool. Um, one of the things I did like that we didn't see is the gang up problem. A lot of people worry about in two players, the two players will gang up on one. Uh, we didn't see that at all. In general, it was chase the leader, which is what you expect, right? Like whoever had the most coins is who everyone stole from. Yeah, so that even, worked really well. Even the take that mechanics are moderated by other aspects of the gameplay. So yeah. stealing gold may hurt you in other ways, depending on the other cards that are getting played. Yeah. Well, the steal cards are two right there, right? Yeah. Unless you're trying not to win that trick. Uh, next was drop it with the four of us after having our tacos uh, played four times in a row. Tori loved it. I think he would have played more. I think we probably could have just played drop it all night. Um, still really digging this one, but you just heard all about that in our review. Yeah, Tori just uh, loves the thinky Dex games. He just he does. Yep. Uh, next was Dice Kingdoms of Valeria. It was the first time playing with Tori and Kat, and they loved it. Kat in particular is like, this is a great game. I am really having fun playing this. But then what happened the next day kind of invalidated that whole play. More on that in a bit. Yeah, we had uh, we had a play the, uh, the other day and that the we loved. And again, it's we loved it, but it was the wrong game. Yep. <laughs> uh, next, we were looking for lighter stuff. We were having some beers that night. Um, we were also playing fight over the, the Bluetooth on the speaker and see whose Spotify playlist could be played louder. And I don't know, Spotify changed something. There used to be a thing where you could join a party and then you're all on and anyone can just play the next song that wasn't working. So we we're just trying to like basically kind of play a game, but hang out. So I grabbed my sets of Rory story cubes, which I've got to say, I haven't touched those in a long time. And they're just as cool as they ever were. They're just neat dice. They're just dice with icons. We played like one of the super basic games where is you roll nine dice and you pick three dice from different sets. Like at most three dice. We, I own three sets. We mixed the three. We picked three dice from each set. Rolled them and then told the story using all the cubes. Um, to various success, I guess we'll go with. <laughs> it was it was fun. We only played the one round, but you know what? It I haven't broken them out in a long time, and it was it was fun to see them get used. It is a great choice for certain levels of inebriation. Uh, next, we played for the queen. Um, this one I messed up. Don't put the queen too early. Um, I'd still love for the queen. 
I mainly broke it out due to a previous good experience where alcohol was involved and wondering mainly if Tori remembered how to play. And and we did get the very rewarding moment where Tori, I pretty sure legitimately wasn't trying to make a joke going to, to cat. So that was kind of awesome. Um, the thing is we put the queen too early, which I didn't realize how much this would mess with the game. Like I wrapped that up and I'm like, do you offend the queen? And I'm like, I don't even know who I am or why I care. Like, like the only thing I know is I love the queen and I answered a couple questions that were like, who did you bring along to hurt the queen? Which I picked Tori. But like, I had no clue who I was. And one of the things I love about that game is that despite the fact you don't have a character sheet or stats, by the end of the game, I've always felt like I was someone. I discovered who I was through playing and, and who I was as a character, not who I was as Mo, because I'm not answering the questions as if it was me. Um, and that just didn't happen at all. And and that I actually kind of ruined the game. I'm like, man, okay, I gotta gotta not I gotta not put the card too early. Like, go for at least half the deck. I'm thinking. Fair. The other thing we saw was Tori basically play the same character, which I'm just starting to worry that Tori may be the same character every time we play. Although maybe only drunk Tori plays the same character. Yeah, I'm honestly trying to decide if I want to start off Friday night with a sober game of that just <laughs> to see how it goes. It's 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 in my list of maybes. Uh, next was Sunday night, more Thrones of Valeria. This time it was with the kids and my mother-in-law who loved it, which I expected. I fully expected my mother-in-law to love this game. Um, she actually owns our copy of Macaron because she enjoyed it more than us being a big trick-taking fan. She adored this. Um, the kids are both really smitten with this one. You played the first game with them, yep. which is great to see. Like they, they, My kids are totally into it. Played great at five players, no problem whatsoever. So yeah, it's such a solid game. If only it had something to do with Valeria. <laughs> now, I did some research today. While they have guilds in both Villages of Valeria and Guild Academies of Valeria, both okay. of those only have four guilds, not five. Okay. Now, I'm sure that somewhere there is someone who is the keeper of Valeria lore, and they can explain to me that because of this thing over here and these things over here, it all makes perfect sense, and you're determining the fate of the kingdom with this game. But to everyone else in the world, this is just a great game, despite the very pasted yeah. on theme. Here's why I hope some of our chat room would have stuck around, because maybe we got an answer. So I never actually read the theme out to anyone. So what the theme actually is of this card game is back when Valeria wasn't even a kingdom yet, there were five great houses who were constantly fighting and backstabbing and assassinating each other in the fact that one would rise to prominence and rule the land temporarily until the next house managed to do the right machinations to become ruler of the land. Well, this game evolved from that power struggle as a game played by the common people with standard cards who like to get a taste of the antics of the nobility. This is a tavern game played for fun and money by the citizens of Valeria based on ancient concepts when the kingdom was founded. But it's interesting because they actually have used the guild colors. So the colors in this game are the four guild colors from all the other Valeria games. But I thought maybe because it was set before the other ones, it was excused because maybe one of the guilds was wiped out and there's well, four they, left. They talk, about, they talk about the Shadows, the Guild of Shadows, yeah. which isn't, I don't think, a playable guild in any of the other games, which is, I think, the extra the guild in the game. But again, this is where yeah. that, you know, there's a lore keeper somewhere who understands this yeah. and nobody else does. I said there is a blurb in the front of all these that that says something like where this fits in or something. Yeah, because the, I, the I story of the rules on this so that I could yeah. get the flavor and try and match it up. Because I then went and read the Villages of Valeria the exp <laughs> right. expansion and the Guild Academies of, of Valeria, which, to be fair, I think I want. Um, <laughs> all right, next was Dice Kingdoms of Valeria four player. One of the kids, Brenda, Deanna, and I. Uh, going great. We're all having fun. Everyone's digging it. Brenda's really enjoying it. Genevieve's got it. Like she, the first few rounds, she had to have some, but she's nailing the combos. And then Deanna's taking some pictures for our review, right? So she's got her camera. We're all kind of paused. And I'm just kind of fiddling around and I'm looking at the, um, the, there's a deck of cards I've never used because I haven't tried the game solo. And they're in there and they're events. And every time you roll doubles, you're going to draw one of these cards and something happens. Well, I happen to know that deck of cards is in like a plastic sleeve and it's upside down. 
And the card that's showing isn't an event. It's like a reference card. I'm like, oh, this game has reference cards. Why wasn't I using those? I totally should have handed those out when I'm teaching this game. Though I'm now leery of doing that because of Dolce. (laughs) But these look pretty good. So I open it up and I'm looking at it. I'm like, man, these are actually really good. It tells you what every symbol means and what you do. But then I notice a rule that we somehow missed. And this is my fault because I'm the one that taught the game. No one else read the rule book where it says you pick one of the dice and take an action and then pass the dice to the next player. Well, when we were playing... We were rolling all six dice and we were using all six dice, which I got to say was interesting. Like there were still interesting decision points, especially on what to use your blue on. And I've got to say with this variant, the blue die is not nearly as big a deal as before because you're like, you use it or you don't every time, which makes those blue circled domains not quite as powerful. But I I totally messed it. We we played wrong. Like like very game changing the fundamentals of gameplay were played wrong. Like this is we always say the bellhops law is the first game you play of any game is played extreme whether you realize it or not. Well the first 3 games we played of this were extreme in such a way that I don't want it like I almost want to remove my logged plays from board game geek cuz they don't count. Yeah, this was tough. And we can't say the rules are wrong. Though, having read the rule book myself, I can say they could have been a bit more clear. Similar to how the how to play video we watched, if you already had the wrong idea from reading the rules, did nothing to dispel that incorrect idea. Yeah, because the way the video does it is like, okay, and here are the actions you can take and explains each die in order, which makes you think you play through each die in order, which is not the case. They never, the video does not say pick one. It yeah. just explains all the options. Exactly. Which, again, I, I'm, I'm not blaming Glenn with the video we watched. No, no, again, I was hoping not. he was going to be in here. But I told him, I watched the video. I read the rules. This is what I do. Okay, my usual game prep for we're going to have a game night in the weekend with a brand new game is I sit down and I read the rules on some off night. Uh, currently, Deanna plays Dragon Quest while I read rule books and I drink coffee or whatever. And then... Later, when we're going to play, that's when I pull out a video because I've already read the rules. I've kind of internalized it, but just kind of the reminder. Plus, it's the get to see the components. So hopefully it solidifies my head. What I should do is do the read the rules with the components out on my game table. I realize that's a better way to do this, but I usually the game table is still dirty from last (laughs) week and I haven't cleaned up or I don't want to go sit it by myself at the game table going through games, which is part of why I don't play solo games. So I use various videos to find to check that and that didn't fail this time because i missed it both when i read the rules and in the video yeah and i have to say like to me the only place where i found it perfectly clear and and like no there was no there was no mistaking what the actual rule was supposed to be was in the quick summary on the back page yeah in the actual rule book the explanation if you were sort of reading along quickly and not really super taking your time, I absolutely yeah, see it's easy to how miss. we can make this mistake. Uh, and it was only again in that quick reference on the back of the rule book where I felt they stated it unequivocally. And on the reference card, oh, which yes, is how I, I discovered saw, I never it. saw those. So it, it's basically the quick reference on a card. Fair. So, so that night we got back and I'm like, Deanna, we're playing again. Plus I wanted to try the game two player. So we played with the proper rules. Um, The big thing that I loved is our complaint that was slowly building after three plays. I had two was downtime. Way too much downtime. That's gone. You're only doing one action. And the chain's what, maybe three deep you can get in this game. So like a long turn is circling three or four things. Right. A normal turn is circling one thing and then passing the dice. Gone. The other thing I was starting to see by our third play is now that I know how to play, I'm finishing every game with every citizen, and that felt wrong. Or I'm having like 11 out of 13 domains or 12 out of 13 domains every time, and that kind of felt off. And I was like, okay, does it really matter what order I'm doing this stuff if I'm going to get it all by the end eventually? Well, sure enough, when you're only using one die, this isn't the way it goes. Plus, we killed way more orcs. And I know it's not called Killing Orcs, which also got us way more coins. And we easily got to the end of the coin track. So, yes, if you play the game by the proper rules, it's better. Who knew? What a shock. I'm looking forward to actually playing Days Kingdoms of Valeria. Yes. So I will say our review is going to be drawn out. Probably not next week. It might be a week after because I am going to make sure we get in enough plays with the proper rules 
specifically replaying it with the same people so that I can get their opinion because I can see the other way to play being a valid way to play. It was still interesting. Like it, I was ready to recommend the game playing it wrong. <laughs> All right. This week wraps up with a Tuesday afternoon game of Thrones of Valeria with Gwen, Deanna, Brenda, and I, where we tried out the team rules and learned pretty quickly this is the way to play. Like, like Sean missed out. I can't believe I didn't try this before, but I was going to try to play it for, you know, three to five times with the standard rules before I threw in a variant. And wow, it's so much better. Um, I, it makes me proud of the fact that we play multiple games, mul they're the same game multiple times with different player counts and play all those options before coming to a final review. I'm really glad we tried this because like, it, it's what makes Euchre shine. It's that team play that really stands out. And the, the, what? Why'd you do that? Why'd you steal my trick? And you're like, oh, because I only had this. Or when, man, we had so many. Brenda was having an off night for the fact that she's played Euchre thousands of times, but for some reason, the first round was thinking me next to her was her partner. So kept stealing tricks or sewering Deanna. And Deanna's like, mom, mom, wait. <laughs> I played this. Why are you playing that? And Brenda just not getting it. And she's like, yep. And I steal the trick. She's like, but I played this and I'm winning the trick. Yep. <laughs> but if you do that, you're stealing. Yep. <laughs> like it, it was pretty funny. Yeah. And I didn't even know there was a team variant. So again, I'm the one that reads the rules and I'm like, why would I point out the variants until I need like drop it? Yeah. We cycle through the variants pretty quick. Cause there's not a lot to learn. It over and over I again. wanted everyone to get down what all the symbols meant and the basic gameplay and mainly remembering that rank thing. Because, man, like assassinating yellow with a red, then realizing you're winning the trick with your one because you just bumped red below your suit is the kind of thing that, like, you just don't get at first. And, well, um, the only thing I'm disappointed that, that like, yes, we reviewed it tonight. I don't know when I would have got in a six player game without putting this off for too many weeks. So I really don't think six is going to be all that different from four, but I have a feeling it's going to be even better. So uh -huh. yes, as far as game plays go, I, I do regret that we didn't get it to a full six player game, but getting six players to play anything around here is a little difficult. Yeah. So that was a very Valeria filled week with some drop it and some other stuff. Yeah, we used to be an Aventuria podcast. Now we're a Valeria podcast. And I have to say, doing that research today, I would love to get the Guild Academies of Valeria. If you're listening, Daily Magic. <clears throat> I said Glenn was here earlier. <laughs> Hopefully he checks out the full show. Maybe once we get through this batch of Valeria games, including Shadow Kingdom's expansion, though, I'll reach out and see what we can do. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Uh, of course, the big thing happening this weekend is I am celebrating my birthday, which I really hope involves some games and will definitely involve some beers. Uh, due to the beers, we're probably going to stick with lighter games, but who knows uh, if it's anything like last week, and I hope it is, there may be more games and multiple game nights with even more games. Like the three of us need to sit down and figure out Weather Machine at some point soon. I, I would like to strike that iron while it's hot, at least be talking about it in the Bellhops tabletop segment, if not getting a full review out. I was thinking one option, since I am going down to, or going up to Hamilton this weekend, is we could pregame heavier stuff Thursday night without the drinking, uh, and then you guys can, you know, drink and drink and be merry on Friday night uh, when not worry about... Uh, not a bad idea. What makes it complicated is my daughter's uh, therapy. Once you throw therapy and dinner in there, our Thursday nights are a little busy. So it might be something we can work out. We will see. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon patrons. We greatly appreciate their support. William Fisher, thank you. Sh uh, Danielle and Owen Thomas, that's thanks for both of you. Sean P. Kelly, thanks, Sean. Derek Hislam, thanks, Derek. Andrew Dacey, thank you as always, Andrew. Well, that was the double bell. That means we've got doors to lock and not a portcullis because Ryan didn't make it tonight. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us across the uh, net at tabletopbellhop.com. All over the web is tabletopbellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice. If you do happen to catch us on your podcatcher of choice, it would be awesome if you went in and left a review. We haven't asked for one of these in a long time. 
but we noticed we got a awesome five star one on Spotify lately, and that made us all happy. So I would love to get that dopamine again. That wraps now up. You, oh, sorry. <laughs> if you dig what we've been doing, it would also be awesome if you stopped by our Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop and tipped your bellhop. Uh, this week, I sent out four hours of bonus audio. So. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us. You are welcome to stick around in our penthouse suite for the after show, but no unboxings tonight. No, I have an unboxing. Oh. What are you talking about? Oh, I didn't know. Big unboxing. Oh, okay. A gift from a fan. Ooh. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.